Hello everyone, this is Dan with the Spiritual Underground Podcast coming to you from the wood shop at DTM Enterprises, my little wood shop in the backyard. Uh, let's see, how do we start today? Let's hit that, dtmww.net for uh, any kind of woodworking handyman needs you have around the Louisville metropolitan area. You can go to that. SpiritualUnderground.org is the website that supports this podcast. You can get uh, show notes and a contact me page is on there. Um, And also uh, photographs of the guests when we're able to do that. And they're willing to do it. Normally under our 12-step 11th tradition about anonymity, some people choose not to have their photographs on. And we honor that here at the Spiritual Underground Podcast. 12-Step Spiritual Recovery is a book by James Christopher Cohn. It's available at Amazon. It is uh, what I consider, and these are my words, the great compendium, the uh, magnum opus, the optimus prime version of the 12 steps. So uh, they're also written for anybody, uh, not limited to those of, uh, that are in the traditional 12-step fellowships. So if you uh, have a missing place in your life and you want to uh, maybe investigate these 12-step tools, uh, we are finding, we have meetings here in Louisville uh, going on now, and we are finding that these tools work for everybody. So 12-step spiritual recovery by James Christopher Cohn at Amazon. And... Um, the music wrapped around today's podcast is uh, going to, uh, we'll do it again since this is a nicotine based one, we'll use Jim's band, uh, what's the name of the song again? Collateral. Collateral Damage. Collateral Damage. That will be the music, giving musical credit to, to, to Jim for the uh, today's podcast. So if you just tuned in, uh, Spiritual Underground Podcast is a recovery based podcast, primarily about 12 step recovery, but we do explore other avenues of recovery. Uh, no matter how somebody found their way and found their voice, uh, find their true selves. My, my definition that I like about what uh, the definition of recovery is, is reclaiming that which was once lost or stolen. And uh, to me, that is coming to find to be comfortable in my own skin, uh, recover my health, recover my uh, sanity, recover my serenity, uh, become comfortable in my own skin once again so that I can be an authentic Dan no matter where I go and no longer uh, wear the masks or uh, those kind of things, the chameleon that I used to be, uh, used to be that I'd be a different person wherever you saw me. And uh, my worst fear was that uh, that I'd be amongst folks who uh, knew two different Dans and I wouldn't know which one to be. So that's what we're doing today. Uh, today's a dual kind of uh, recovery uh, podcast. Uh, our guest Dave, just I've met him quite some time ago, but didn't know him that well. I met him on the website that uh, that that where a few of us and you heard us talk about that where we uh, stopped using nicotine. And uh, he was a couple months in a group that was a couple months later than I. And one of the things we did there were, was try to support the groups who were starting later. Once you had your footing, you would uh, jump in and, and, and attempt to help support those guys who are just starting out because you had been in their footsteps before. And uh, Dave come along and, and then we left or we got banned from that bed website and we're gone and, and we started up another little avenue to be to, to, to stay accountable to one another and stay in communication. And we've been inviting new people and we got some new quitters in there. Matter of fact, we've got uh, two guys who just came across their 100 days of nicotine free. And we have another guy who is uh, 50 something today. And we've just opened the doors for it. And one of our friends, Brad Cochise, he uh, invited Dave in, and I heard a little about what his story was and wanted to share it on the podcast as soon as I heard it. A uh, bell rung in my head, and I said, hey, I want to see if I can get this guy's story on here. Uh, I don't want to tell too much of it, because he'll tell it as we get through it, but uh, Dave not only has uh, stopped using nicotine, but has also uh, lost a tremendous amount of weight. So... Uh, We'll talk about that as we go through here. And so today, first, let's uh, Jim's with us today, as usual, as my co-host on the uh, Nicotine Quitting Podcast. How you doing today, Jim? I'm doing great. Always happy to be here. Good, good. Had a little technical difficulty in the beginning, which is typical on these remote podcasts. Uh, how are you, Dave? 
I'm good. I'm happy to be here as well. <clears throat> Everybody ready for the holidays? This is what, uh, three days before Christmas? Oh, yeah. I spent all day yesterday shopping. So, I, I think yeah. I'm done. <laughs> well, I was ready to have Christmas with the girls, uh, my daughters, yesterday, but unfortunately, one of them is uh, get, got the flu, so we had to call it off. Maybe I'll actually do Christmas with the girls on Christmas this time. Hey, how about that? Oh, wow. Maybe that's a blessing in disguise. Yeah, it might be. Though I feel sorry for the baby, I, you know, mm -hmm. they're 10, but you, you still just picture them as a little baby and... So I, oh well i had something oh. the week before last it laid me out and i would wish it on nobody so uh and it's been going around i got buddies and it seems like it's all around the country of uh people getting this deal and whether if i had the flu or not i didn't go to the doctor or go get it checked out or anything but just wrote it out for three days and it got better yeah there's definitely a thing going around here too so i know my dad had it even while he was in the hospital dad had it and uh, wife had it here a couple of days ago. Not real bad, but she had it. Luckily, I haven't had it. So, knock yeah. on wood. Yeah, so if I, <laughs> is that desk you're sitting at wood? Yeah, yep. Cool. So, uh, so we got all our introductions out of the way. Uh, so, Dave, um, you know, when I start this thing, usually, uh, I usually ask a guy, do you happen to know the day you stopped using nicotine? I know exactly the day I stopped. It was December twentieth. Wow, uh, yeah, that's right. And, yeah, because I just I was just at two years. Yep, that, uh, yesterday. That is right. Yesterday. Uh, so I recall you posting that. So yeah, cool. Two years off the nicotine. Uh, let's start out a little bit about how you uh, where where you're from, where you grew up, um, uh, this family system kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, I'm. I live in Western Pennsylvania. I'm about uh, about forty minutes north of Pittsburgh. I was born in Pittsburgh, lived here pretty much, uh, pretty much my whole life, except for, uh, I did a little, I lived when I was younger for about three months in Chicago, but I was really young and don't remember much about it, but, but I've pretty much lived in this area my whole life. Um, I, uh, my dad raised my sister and I, um, I don't, I don't even know my mom. She, uh, she took off when I was younger and. Uh, my grandma kind of took the place of my mom, so uh, my dad my dad worked a lot, and uh, my grandma pretty much raised me. My grandma and my grandfather. Um, I grew up pretty much uh, with the Amish. <laughs> uh, a lot of people find that funny, but um, my immediate family is is pretty small. It's just my sister and my dad and my grandmother and my grandfather who's passed now, but. Um, but in all actuality, I had a pretty big family. Uh, my so dad's boss. Were, were oh, I'm you, sorry. Were you Amish or were you just in around Amish? No, I was not Amish, but I grew up around them so much that I could have been. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yep. Uh, my dad's boss, uh, who he worked for, was Amish, and he was literally the next door neighbor to my grandmother where I spent most of my time. So, you know, I grew up with his kids, and he had 12 kids. So. Mm. You know, and then I ended up actually growing up and working for them as well later on. But, um, but yeah, I, I grew up around the Amish. They were pretty much my brothers and sisters. I mean, you know, you know how things were back then as a childhood. You spent, you know, your summers and everything outside. And, you know, so they they pretty much were. Uh, they're pretty much my family. You know, we had dinner with them. And, and stuff and they interest me a lot we have a uh, just west of us we have a pretty large uh amish and and mennonite community separate i guess uh but uh when i there's uh you see them quite a bit in my place out out that i have out in the country and uh mm -hmm. and if you go just a little bit more west uh in, in southern south southern indiana uh or southwestern indiana you'll find a pretty 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 large community they come here yeah, to the metropolitan area and do a lot of construction there you'll mm -hmm. see them doing bricklaying and for house framing yep. and roofing and and, and yep. a lot of that well uh, that's exactly what uh, that's exactly what they did we were carpenters yep so. uh, yeah famous for their craftsmanship did you pick yeah. up, did yep. you pick up any of that oh yeah yep yeah i 
Well, like I said, I ended up actually working for them out of school, worked with my dad and his crew, and uh, frame, we were framing carpenters. Yeah. And basically, they uh, with the housing economy and stuff, they downsized, and um, dad and I both ended up losing our jobs with them. But, um, but we used to build, uh, we did a lot of work up around Cleveland, uh, Menor, Ohio. I don't know if you're familiar with a lot of that, but... Uh, Chardon, Ohio, and we were building like 10,000 square foot homes. Wow. Know? And we were putting them up in like a week and a half. I mean, they don't piss around when they go to work. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's funny, you know, people don't realize they think of carpenter crews, you know, with forklifts moving bunks of two by fours and stuff like that. You know, we do everything by hand. Right. So, yeah. um, I, I learned real quick what work was. <laughs> so, so did somebody, uh, I, you know, the one thing around here, and, and it's a little bit, uh, this gets a little bit off path, but I don't really care because I'm interested in it. Uh, how did they get to work? Uh, that was mainly the purpose of my dad. Uh, they, they hired drivers. Um, yep. Our crew had two drivers because our crew was spit, split. Um, our My boss and half of the crew lived here in Pennsylvania. And then his brother's and the other half of the crew lived over in Middlefield, Ohio, which is about an hour from here. So they had a driver from there, and then they had a driver from here. My dad was the driver for here, but he also worked with them during the day. Yeah. So where the other driver from Ohio, he didn't, uh, he didn't actually work with them. He just drove and sat and sat in his van and, and, w- and waited until the end of the day. Yep. Uh, that's so. uh that 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 interests me. We have a. Well, another one of the things, we have a gas refrigerator, a propane-operated refrigerator in our cabin in the country. We don't have any electricity or water there, and uh, and, and when you want one of those, you go to you go near the Amish community because they <laughs> sell those types of appliances there. Uh, you can't get that here at the, uh, at, the, at the normal appliance store here in mm-hmm. town. But what's funny is, you know, you bring up a good point about having, like, the propane uh, refrigerator and all that kind of stuff. The area of Amish that I live in are called Old World Amish. They don't even have that stuff. I mean, oh, they're they? not allowed to have. No, they don't have anything like that. I mean, I think if you go out to Lancaster, um, they have some of the newer modern amenities, if you want to call it that. But here, they don't have anything like that. I mean, they're very, they're very strict. Um, in each little, in each little. Uh, group or uh, however you want to they have a bishop and they and they 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 make the rules for the group i mean every little group is has a little bit different rules of what they can and can't have and can't do and um some are more lenient than others this this area is is one of the more stricter in the whole country from what i understand yeah well i think as in pennsylvania kind of like the homeland of the the it is yeah Uh, that that, however i don't i really don't know how what the roots are but uh, for whatever reason you know it's technically attached as i am uh, i do love going down to my place where that stuff is not available to me and and i have there's a little draw to for me inside about some uh uh, different paste kind of life where you're not uh, attached to all these uh modern amenities oh i agree there's you know i'm i'm an it guy i mean my my day revolves around computers and smartphones and all that stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, there are, there's times I'll grab my backpack, you know, if the weather's nice, and I'll go spend two or three days out in the woods just living out of the backpack to get away from this stuff. Yeah. Because I think that, I think as a, as a job opportunity, the computers and all that stuff is great. I don't think that we need to have it nearly as much in our lives as we do. Yeah, I know. I, for me, my spirit needs a break from it now and again. And, and exactly. Down at our place, uh, we don't have any cell phone service. It, it's not even available there. You had to sure. you had to go up to the top of the hills to to get out, and uh, and I like that. Now, one thing I found is that I don't have to go as far up the hill as I used to have to go, uh, <laughs> and and I and I assume probably someday that that'll that that will change and and it, we'll have surface in. all the way. Yeah, it is. It's creeping in. The the, the, yep. the signals are getting stronger, and we're down in a hollow where the 
I guess uh, the the signals are just not getting down in there yet, but mm. I would imagine eventually they will. So uh, oh, yeah. did you do that uh, when you said you worked for them? Is does that through like did you work there during high school and everything, or was oh, yeah. post yeah. high school? Uh, my, no, my summer vacations were spent working. Um, I mean, from I mean, Dad would take us because the Amish take their kids to work. I mean, at ten, twelve years old, you know, they have to learn the trade. So right. Dad took us, you know, or took uh, took me as well. You know, I was I was going to work and you know, at 12, 13 years old and learning how to, I mean, at that time it was just, you know, picking up scraps or carrying lumber or that kind of stuff. But, right, needed to be done. And the first question that everybody asks me, you know, is, well, what about, you know, OSHA and child labor law? Well, that doesn't apply to the Amish. Yeah. And even though I'm not Amish, we were employed by them. So we didn't have to go by any regulations or anything. I mean, 12 years old and we're running around construction sites, you know, so that that didn't luckily nobody ever got hurt but <laughs> yeah well, you know uh, I, uh my dad grew up in uh construction trades too and and uh i say this uh, i don't know if it's exactly right but that's what he always fell back to whenever he would try another venture he sold real estate and he sold insurance and right. did a lot of different things ran a bar for a while but in between those things uh he would go back to construction trades and i spent a lot of time as a child following him around picking up drywall scraps you know, yep. doing the various uh, odd jobs uh, uh, for for a friend of his, uh, doing doing the same kind of thing, and mm-hmm. and certainly was not old enough to be uh, <laughs> working, so to speak. But nobody really yeah. spoke of it back then. Uh, do you have any brothers or sisters? I have uh, one sister. Um, she's a couple years younger than me. She was actually born in Chicago for the little bit that I lived out there. Um, we're we're really close. Uh, I'm really close with my family. We we hunt together. We fish together. I mean, we we do a lot together. We live close within reason. And um, she's she's a, she's a good person. Um, she's helped me through a lot of stuff. Um, Obviously, she didn't have to go to work on the cruise. Being no, 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 no. No, actually, that wouldn't have went well because that's the Amish don't believe that women are to do that kind of work. And, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, what I was getting at. So when, uh, yeah. tell me about like, um, you know, so at what was your peak weight? Uh, my biggest, I weighed 445 pounds. Amazing. Goodness. And so were yeah. you always big when you were, I mean, did that start? Yeah, I, growing up I was always big. I mean, my dad was, my dad's a big dude. And, yeah, and my grandma used to always say it was hereditary, well, you know, with education, I've learned now that's just not true. But my whole family, with the exception of my grandmother, has always been, uh, you know, bigger men. Um, I mean, I can remember in high school, when I was lifting for football and stuff my senior year, getting weighed and all that, I mean, I, I weighed two, I weighed like 280 in my senior year of high school. Um, I was a lot more muscular then than I was now with lifting and working and everything else, but I was still big. Um, I think I think for me the weight really started to come on uh, about ten years ago when uh, when we lost our job working with the Amish. Uh, I sat around and ate a lot and just kind of got fat and lazy and uh, didn't really pay much attention to my health or anything. And yeah, because c- construction work, or you know, I mean, that's work. You know, I mean, that's yeah, uh, especially yeah. with uh, out without the help of. Uh, uh, forklifts and and various yeah, things like that you are actually doing a lot of work so you'd have to be putting on yeah. a lot of calories to offset uh and that the ones i think was the other thing. A day. i don't think yeah i don't think it was necessary i mean i'm not trying to make excuses but i don't think it was necessarily just me sitting around being fat and lazy i think a lot of it was i was used to a certain amount to maintain what i was doing yeah you know and you know, when you're not burning that amount of calories now every day, that and that appetite's still there. And then you add on top of that boredom, which boredom eating is one of the worst things. You know, people don't realize how how I call it head hunger. You know how much that affects the, how much you eat. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I believe too. You know, and I, I'm sure there's a gen- there is. You know, I think your grandma's right. At some level, there is a genetic component. Uh, you know, it, it can. I think the you know, there, I know there's a genetic component in in addiction, 
alcoholism. Oh, yeah. yes. uh, I, I know. I, I know. We know through science that that is actually the case, uh, and, and I'm sure you know at some level. It is my belief that a lot of that stuff is a lot the same. It's uh, trying to find something, you know. Uh, I, you know, I drank when I was bored, you know, uh, and I drank more when I was bored. If I was able just to sit around, then uh, then that's what I did. And if I was uh, whatever other substance I had available to me, uh, that's what I would reach for. Just, I mean, like, because the flip side of that is like just sitting here doing exact, exactly nothing. And, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> and that's awful hard to yeah. do. Yep. Yeah, and that's the thing. I didn't, like, when we lost our job, I didn't go out and just get another job. And there's actually a reason for that. I'm, I'm actually legally blind. Um, oh, I don't are drive. You? I don't do it. Yes. I can see, but under legal standards, I'm blind. Uh, so by me not being able to drive and all that, it's hard for me to get a job. And, you know, yeah. I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be 100% personal with you. Um, I currently, right now, and for my whole life, I'm disabled because of my vision yeah i worked for the amish under the table i got paid cash Mm -hmm. so i didn't lose that or my health insurance or anything else so when that job you know fell out or however you put it you know i didn't rush out because i would lose my health insurance you know how was i going to get back and forth how was i you know my my brain just kind of couldn't handle everything you know out of high school, I had a job that was paying really well that, you know, I didn't have to think about transportation or anything else, you know, because I had it. Like, yeah. I went to work with my dad. And, were you, you born know. legally blind or were you born with yes. these conditions? Yep. Okay. Yep. I actually, uh, I'm albino. <laughs> oh, are you? Very, yeah, I have very, very light colored skin. I have blonde, well, what's left of my hair is blonde hair. Uh, with the exception of my beard. Uh, I was going to bring up the beard. Yeah, the beard is red, but and nobody can figure out why. <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. But I have, I, I am, I have what's, I have a form of albinism, which is actually a, a fairly rare form because I have the eyes, the hair, and the skin. Usually, you get like two out of three. No, I got all three. Hmm. So, and that's uh, that comes with the with the eyesight issue, right? That's uh, I think that's a pretty common thing with with. Yeah. Uh, yep. Would you say al- albinism? Is that albinism? Okay, yes. I, I don't think I've yep. ever heard that uh, term. Yep. So and, that and that's another thing. P- people laugh at me, you know, when they hear, you know, I was a carpenter and used to climb around on roofs and I run chainsaws and I shoot guns and I do this and I do that. Then I turn around and tell them, "Well, I'm legally blind." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you should see the looks I get. <laughs> but I, I, I'm what you would call a high functioning. <laughs> Yeah. So, what 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 does that look like? So, from a sight perspective, is it do you just don't is is it a blurry kind of thing, or is it a is it no, limited vision or? Well, light affects my eyes a lot. Um, light is the is the number one killer for my vision. If it's bright out or it's my vision goes down horribly. Hmm. Um, I wear hats and sunglasses and you know everywhere I go just for the light. Yeah. Uh, the way my eye doctor has explained it to me, it, it's like looking through somebody else's eyes, but everything is about 50 times smaller. Hmm. So everything is clear. I can see colors. Now, certain colors clash. I, I am technically colorblind, but I can see like reds and all that. But it, it's, everything is just small to me. I have to look really hard at something. Um, I have three different pairs of glasses that I wear, depending on what I'm doing. Um, I use special software on my computers I use special uh, viewers to read books and that sort of, like my textbooks for school and that sort of stuff and, yeah that's, I was going to um, ask about some of those things because uh, being an IT guy means looking at a computer screen yeah well yeah. I yeah. the good thing is you're able you're, you're adapting you, you've got these adaptive devices or yeah. or techniques that you're using you're not being held back by this by not not from the sound of it yeah, well, I, I learned at an early age with growing up the way that I did, being such an outdoors person and the stuff that we did that either I learned how to figure out how to do it on my own or else it was going to be a very long life. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, there wasn't none of this sit around playing video games and all that stuff. I mean, I had to learn how to, I mean, I didn't have to learn this stuff, but I wanted to, you know, learn how to hunt, learn how to shoot, learn how to, you know, run the chainsaws, do the carpentry work. You know, that was my life. So I had to learn to do it. 
You yeah, know, that, and, those are very interesting traits, you know, to uh, because I think a human spirit wants to do that. You know, we don't want to uh, succumb to any limitations. Uh, one of the things is obviously uh, somewhat of a peer pressure related thing where you see other people, not necessarily pressure in itself of, from directly from them, but yeah. uh, you're seeing other people do things and, and, and I want to do those things too. Boy, yeah. And uh, so you're going to find a way to do it where somebody uh, like, uh, well, frankly, like myself, without any limitations of that matter, uh, I don't even really have to try or, or do anything special to, 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 to make those things happen for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I would think, and, and I'm going to go on some limbs here because uh, that's what I do as the host of this thing, is those... Uh, I would think those limitations somewhat had you put into a position where you obviously felt separate from friends and people. Uh, uh, you know, I just always felt a little different oh, yeah. than everybody else. And, and, and for me, even though not that, what some different things that I experienced as a child had me feeling like uh, less than, like I'd caught some kind of uh, bad roll yep. of the dice in life. And, uh, uh, no, and, I, and, and you're 100% right, you know. Growing up, you know, you watch these other people doing stuff, and I'm struggling doing what seems to be the simplest task because of the limitations that I got. And, you know, and that was tough. Hunting for me was a very, there was a couple of years that I, I, I told my dad I didn't want to hunt, you know, because dad was really big into squirrel hunting. I don't know if you guys are hunters or not, but. Um, I am. You know, squirrels are hard to see for me in the woods. <laughs> squirrels yeah, are hard to see for everybody. <laughs> well, okay, yeah. You know, and it would piss me off. You know, I can hear them. I can hear them. On, my hearing is exceptional. Uh, I can hear them on the ground. I can't see them, you know. Yeah. And, I, and, and I would get frustrated, and I would tell my dad, you know, I said, I'm not going to do this no more because dad, dad was understanding of it, but dad, you know, I'm sure you guys know how that generation is. You know, dad also was, you know, well, you need to do this. And he tried to push me, and I think in his own way that that was that was good, you know, right. that he was pushing me. But you know, and it was frustrating as hell. And it just got to where you know, finally, through trial and error, we learned different things. You know, I never, you know, Dad never thought about putting you know a scope on a shotgun. Mm. Well, now I have a scope on my shotgun. Yeah. You know, if I, you know, if 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 I can see the squirrel in the scope. You know, with a modified choke in my shotgun, there's a good chance I'm going to get it. Yep, you that's know, interesting. And my my deer rifle, you know, I hunt with a 308, and it it has a six to twenty four power scope on it. Yeah, <laughs> and that's for hunting in the woods. Right. So you know, and and, and there again, though, we learned to adapt for it. But going back to what you were saying, yeah, it was very hard. You know, learning learning the carpentry skills. You know, reading blueprints was 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 a big challenge for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, when our boss was, was teaching me how to do that, you know, it got to where I was carrying around, again, like I said, two different pairs of glasses, and then I was breaking them at work and, you know, carrying them in tool belts and everything else, and and school was school was a bit of a challenge. I mean, yeah, everything. But I so talked to so curi- many people. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, uh, forgive my ignorance on this, but what do the Amish think about alcohol and and tobacco what 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 are their views on on those kind of well tobacco is a big is a big thing in the amish i actually attribute a good portion of of my addiction to tobacco to growing up around the amish um they 90 percent of them smoke um a lot of them chew um i mean i grew up you know smoking they they smoke the uh the pipes a lot yeah um this pipes and little cigars they don't like in our area they're not allowed to actually smoke white cigarettes i know it sounds stupid but um so i grew up smoking all that stuff you know as teenagers you know and all that and the amish the way their belief is they're allowed to smoke and use tobacco at age 16 because by then they're out of school and they're working so you know when they're 16 i'm 16 still in high school and shit and i'm you know sneaking out smoking in the barn and everything else yeah tobacco is a big thing with them that's interesting alcohol alcohol on the other hand um alcohol is a big thing with the teenagers um which with any other you know basically society um you know they they go to their i've been to many amish parties in the woods you know um now, once they turn, once they get to a certain point and they join the church or they get married, or then the alcohol really cuts down. Even as adults, they'll, they'll, 
they do drink a little bit, um, but not. They don't drink like like we do. You know, they'll they'll have you know a little drink of something or like around Christmas or if it's real hot in the summer and our and we're up in the garage or something. You know, they'll they'll have a beer. You know, but they don't drink regular like like we do. Okay, so it's um, neither the habits are verboten. It's just what they embrace tobacco. Do they grow their own, or are they allowed to buy it from from the store? Uh, they don't. They don't. They don't grow it around here. They buy it from stores. Um, they go like the smoke shops and buy like the Winchester little cigars. That's real popular. Um, like I said, they smoke the pipes, um, which I didn't know this until later on in life. I didn't know that when you smoke a pipe, you're actually not supposed to inhale it. They do. So did I. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> or a cigar, but, technically. Yeah, so or a cigar. Yeah, they smoke Swisher Sweets and Winchesters, and they inhale all them. But hell, I did. But yeah, to, yeah, tobacco is a is a really big thing. Like I said, growing up with them, I, I attribute a lot of my tobacco. I mean, not making excuses, but I grew up around it. Well, you got to get exposed to it someplace, and where it's not necessarily uh, one of the things that we talk about in Twelve Step is to actually look at where these things came from, and that, and it's not a blame game; it's uh, causes and conditions. It's uh, uh, what it's the fact of it's the data of how you got exposed to it. Uh, yeah, my, well, my my family I, used. Uh, I, you know, I watched my grandpa die of emphysema. And yet still continue to, you know, I remember being at his house and he's on a bed in oxygen and I would go outside and smoke a cigarette, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and knowing full well that that's exactly what put this guy on the bed. Uh, mm-hmm. But but would still walk out and do that. And, and my mother smoked, too. And I watched, although uh, when I was 10 years old, she got a breast cancer diagnosis and and from that point forward until she passed at 72, she still smoked, although she tried to hide it. She tried to, she was, I guess, in our world, she called a ninja smoker, which is a damn hard yeah. thing to do because cigarette smoke sinks so oh, bad yeah. that uh, trying to, she would go in her bathroom and close the door and smoke out the window and think that nobody smelled it. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, that reminds me of something. I didn't mean to interrupt you. When you're done, no, I, have, I have to tell you something. My my grandfather, who I was really close with, um, you know, uh, passed away about ten years, well, about eight years ago now, with emphysema from smoking. And he was so addicted to that that he would go like behind the garage outside and smoke and, and throw the butt down and try to you know kick grass over it or whatever. And my grandma, who was big into gardening. Uh, would go around and she'd find them, and, and it was, I mean, horrible, but hilarious as hell now. Actually blamed me for it one day. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> Said that they were my butts, and, yeah, but meanwhile, you could smell it on them, you know. Right. But, but I know exactly what, I mean, he died of emphysema, and I, he supposedly quit smoking for about three years, you know, when he was diagnosed, and we don't ever think that he actually did. Yeah, I know and my finally, mom actually quit for some period. She, she's made an attempt at quitting when my son was born. I think she actually did, and I don't know for how long, but we didn't smell it, and you didn't see the, you know, she kept this little uh, yeah. plastic baggie full of cigarette butts, which was awful. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I could, like that. I'll tell you what, that plastic baggies might be nice, but they will not contain that smell of a, of a, of a wet, put-out cigarette. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a smell that's just hard to, to, to mask. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, I've said uh, before, that, and, and I don't know this to be completely true uh, for sure, but for me, uh, stopping the nicotine was definitely harder than than the dope and the booze for this dude. Uh, one one reason I know is because I had some huge consequences wrapped around me for the with the with the dope and the booze. I was going to go to prison if I didn't straighten up there and uh and i just uh the the nicotine was not that way and it and it and it uh well i think if you if you look it up if, if you google it it's i think it's in the top three uh most addictive substances yeah uh, in the world and 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 uh, it's 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 tough stuff to quit even when you know even faced with huge consequences like death uh, people yeah. continue. I mean, go to the ride by a hospital and you watch people outside yeah. with their oxygen bottle and a cigarette. <laughs> yeah, smoking you know? a cigarette. Yep. Uh, it, it, oh, I agree. I mean, it's just like you, my family. My dad chewed. Uh, I I can remember in high school because I chewed all through high school. I put it way back in, and 
you know, the teachers didn't say, I got caught a couple times, but I used to sneak out, like, wait till my dad went to bed. I used to take a, you know, like you were saying, like a Ziploc sandwich bag or whatever. I'd go out and take a big pinch out of my dad's can and put it in that bag so I'd have chew for the next day. Yeah, uh-huh. until I got old enough and found a place to where I could buy it on my own. And Dad chewed that Timberwolf stuff, which used to make me sick. But it was, and that's the other thing. You know, I was doing something that you know was almost making me sick, but you know, I still wanted it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it didn't that, change anything. Yeah, that's definitely uh, an interesting thing amongst a lot of these addictions. Is that uh, you know, the first time I got drunk, uh, I felt like hell for the next day and uh i don't know how much longer but once i got to feeling better i wanted to do it again and the first few times of smoking cigarettes and using tobacco uh it made me sick to begin with it was uh, it was an awful feeling but you push through you know and (laughs) and somehow another yeah until i got introduced to until i got introduced to copenhagen and then that was like oh this is great (laughs) yeah yeah got rid of the timberwolf shit but well, I know that story. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, smoking was never, I mean, I did a little bit as a teenager, you know, with the Amish. And when I turned 18 and could buy it, I did it for, I don't know, about a year or two. But I always went back to chew, and I never really considered myself much of a smoker. I, I, I tend to smoke, uh, or I used to when I drank. Um, yeah. I, I guess that's common. Yeah, you know, it I is. Could, I could smoke a pack of cigarettes in two hours if I was drinking, but. Yeah, I have a couple uh, friends uh, who, um, you know, that's the only time in my in my in my recovery circles with alcohol, uh, who only drank when they or only smoked when they drank, and when they yeah. stopped when they stopped drinking, they just quit smoking, and that that's yep. interesting to me how uh, how the I guess you know whatever component that is that that causes that that particular allows you what I don't know even what word it is that makes you addicted to to mm-hmm. nicotine and how they were able just to stop and you know and some of the rest of us uh you know frankly well, a lot of us uh, still you know having trouble a lot of trouble getting off the nicotine you know mm-hmm. years after they've quit smoking and or after they've quit drinking and, and doping yeah I got well, a couple friends me. that were able to do the same thing. You know, they they would only smoke when they were drinking and not after. I, I don't know how they did it. it. It really amazed me. I was like, you, you got to be lying. You're just lying to me. Yeah. That, you really uh, want a cigarette right now, don't you? Nope. 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 Don't need one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's the thing with me. I, I, you know, yeah, I smoked when I drank, but there was a reason because, you know, chewing Copenhagen and chugging Jack and Coke, you know, didn't go very well. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I would, you know, I would smoke just because I wasn't chewing. Yeah. yeah. And once I was done drinking, I was back to chewing again. So I was still getting, you know, the nicotine delivery just in a different form. Yeah, that's real. That's that's interesting. <laughs> that, that's how most people uh, just kind of dabble in the other delivery systems anyway. It is just, yep. I mean, like me, it was the different social circumstances I was in would drive the train yeah. on, you know, Oh, yeah. on what I was going to use. That's why when I was at work, I had a, an e-cig, which, by the way, guys, I found one in my truck uh, on Friday. Oh, an really? old oh, wow. e-cig. And so I took that sucker, I marched it right back into my office, right in front of my guys, and I said, okay, you are my witnesses. And I just tore the crap out of it and threw it away. I said, I'm a hunt- I'm 804 days quick, God damn it! I am not doing this. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I always had an e-cig, had the extra batteries for it, had a Ziploc bag full of nicotine lozenges. I had my Copenhagen. I had packs of cigarettes. I had everything based off of where I was. In my work truck, I can't smoke. I'm going to dip. If I'm in a meeting, well, I can't dip, can't smoke, but by God, I got my lozenges. So, yeah, where there's a will, there's a way. And with our addiction... You know, I, I'm surprised that anybody that's, you know, started as a dipper, never touched anything else, or a smoker, likewise. It, it just, everybody's tried something else, in my opinion. Yeah, oh, I'm with you. Every, I mean, everybody that I've ever talked to, you know, I think my grandfather who died from smoking, I don't think he ever chewed it. Just the thought of it, he said, used to make him sick. He used to make fun of me for doing it. But for the most part, I think everybody has you know like you said has, has done a little bit of it all i mean they have one main that they prefer but 
<laughs> yeah, or they started with cigs and wanted and, and, and tried cigars or mm-hmm. pipe. My dad did that, and but his, they all had their pre, you know, preferred delivery system, of course. Yep. But yep. I, I, you know. Anyway, <laughs> no, it just you, your e-cigarette thing reminds me when I first quit. Um, I quit. Well, if you guys know, two years the other day. So I quit five days before Christmas. My wife was not happy. Um, <laughs> she was happy that I quit. She was not happy with the timing. And at that time, I had like three cans of Copenhagen in the freezer. So she took it before I got to it and hid it somewhere. With the thought that, you know, come Christmas, if I get to where I'm going to kill our families, that she would <laughs> she would give it to me. And luckily, oh it never got God. to that. But it, it was like four months into my quit. I was going through something and, and, and came across it. I was going through the desk in the living room or something. I came across them. Now, I'm sitting there at like four months, and I'm holding three, you know, brand new cans of Copenhagen in my hand, and I'm alone. You know, she's at work, kids at school. You know, it took a lot of willpower to throw that away. And I went and got on that site that, you know, uh, that we used to quit, and I, you know, made this big long post and ranted, (laughs) you know, about, you know, why she didn't trust me or anything, but, you know, I... But uh, I got through it. I didn't use it, so. But okay. but even to this day, there's there's still there's still times. I just recently moved out here, um, more into the country. I was living in an apartment in town, and living in the country brings outdoor activities and stuff that I haven't done since I quit. And just the other day, I was outside putting up like Christmas ornaments or something, and it was just the weirdest thing. I actually like wrenched around into my back pocket like I was going for a can that wasn't there and it just it was almost like subconsciously you know uh, old habits once in a while yep yeah there's certain triggers and i don't know where they come from but once in a while just out of the blue you know and some of yeah. them i get completely like whenever i have a have a uh like hunting and and certain things that are just solid triggers you know and yeah. yard work and and i've been i went to doing this handyman gig and i'll be working outside somebody's uh, you know outside someplace and and uh and it'll just hit me you know and right out of the blue still here over a bit few months over two years yeah. behind me uh i'll just oh well, i like i had caught myself the other day slapping a pocket like where's and like kind of i wear a <laughs> pair of like cargo kind of pair of pants or 511 pants actually but and and i would always keep that can in that side cargo pocket and uh and and i caught myself i giggled that i slapped that pocket <laughs> uh <laughs> figured out which which freaking pocket it was in this much this this far down the road i, I yeah, still do that to this day but i'm checking to make sure i have my uh, uh holes cough drops just to make sure I have a couple that you know my uh, uh, my pacifier that I still use. Mm. So but. I was using I was using Tic Tacs and still I got on the, the weight loss journey with that surgery and stuff. I wasn't allowed to eat them anymore because of my stomach because I was eating like a box a day. Oh really? And they told me yeah they told me I wasn't allowed to do that. <laughs> so I had to wean myself off of that even. <laughs> yeah, it's so very. How- very interesting how we make a substitute like that you know and 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 we will switch that addiction to something else you know and oh, yeah. even though it'll be in, and i i know that i have done it in my recovery where you know i have actually used uh you know and even though it's a healthy thing uh i, I have used uh i use yoga like the same way as a substitution you know and even though it's a good thing for me uh i i, I went at it just a little extra heavy you know and and um, well, you know, a lot of people you'll see. So I would get to this weight loss thing, um, and and I don't I don't want to turn the corner too fast. But I have a friend, and I have some experience with similar thing as what you're, uh, what you have done, uh, Dave. And uh, met a gal when I was first getting sober, or actually before I got sober, and she had had the weight loss surgery and had lost a, a lot of weight, and was uh, talking to me a lot about the the nutritional stuff, and 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 taught me a lot about. Uh, uh, about eating better um, you know she she refused to use the word diet um, yeah but uh, just just uh, eating better and one of the things that she noticed that she would she did she actually switched when she stopped uh, um, 
you know, started bringing down the weight and started controlling what she was intaking on that end, she started leaning actually where she was actually drinking more. Uh, yeah, I've just, heard that that is a, is a problem. It's, it's to take off the weight and then switch to something else, you know, and in that case, yeah. you know, that's like a, you know, uh, 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 and, and then uh, the flip side of that is I know some guys who have really blown up after stopping either smoking or stopped drinking and drugging. Uh, they switched to food. And, I gained 15 and, pounds the first month I quit. Did you? I was going to ask about that. Yep. yep, I gained well because, well, I don't. I didn't mean to take away from you there, but it just it made me think about you know I had I I, I always wanted to quit chewing, but my main de- deterrent to quit chewing was to have the surgery and stuff. I had to have it. They were yeah. nicotine nicotine testing me. Yeah. So it so was out of necessity for everything else. Let's go back to that to whenever, uh, like the, the events and stuff that led up to you deciding to have the surgery or, you know, deciding the weight was something you couldn't deal with anymore. And how did you, uh, what was the path that, that led you to those decisions? Well, actually, my wife, um, my wife uh, was going to do it as well. Um, she was, I mean, she was severely overweight um, as well as I was. And she, uh, she tried to do it a year before, um, and I was just kind of like, eh, you know, if I need to lose weight, I'll go on a diet. I didn't really realize how big I was, um, and she didn't get she didn't get through the six months work of worth of diet classes and workup and everything because she works and she had to miss a couple of different appointments and all this, and they kind of kicked her out of the program. Mm. Well, when she started, was going to restart it again, you know, I started to look at myself a little bit. Um, my dad, uh, my dad is in bad health, um, and, and some of it's due to his weight. And my dad, my dad will go probably now about 350, but he was a lot bigger. And, uh, and I started to look at him and I was like, you know, I don't want to be, you know, 55 years old and having to have four nurses help me in and out of chairs and. And it just, you know, I was getting older. Things were starting to, you know, click with me a little bit. I was, I had a different self-image of myself. I was starting to actually look like the big person I was to myself instead of just, ah, I'm a little overweight. <laughs> yeah, they call you it know. body dysmorphia. Yeah. And so wow, when she I'm going to have to look that one up. <laughs> that's where you don't see yourself. You know, when you look in the mirror, you don't see what everybody else sees. Exactly. Yeah. Um, wow. And, you know, the wife was going to go through it again. And at first it just started as, you know, oh, I'm, I'm going to do it, you know, to support you. And, you know, and I do need to work on myself a little bit, not realizing how bad out of shape I was. I had sleep apnea, uh, which was really bad. Um, luckily, I didn't have any other health concerns that obesity causes, but I was headed in that direction. I was borderline diabetic and um, that sort of stuff. So it just kind of started as I was going to better myself a little bit and support her in the process. To be honest, when I started all this, I was going to go to the diet classes and do all that and then kind of skip out on the surgery part of it. <laughs> oh, because at that she, point you had it. You had it down, right? You knew exactly what you would need to do. Exactly. Kind of like, uh, I, kind of like quitting. I don't need all this yeah. crap. I do this myself. Yeah, she, she didn't know at the time that that was my plan, but... That was my plan, you know. I'll I'll go do the diet classes and sit through all the all the what I thought was bullshit then, and um, you know. And then when it comes time to actually schedule the surgery, I'll be like, you know, I've got all the tools I need. I don't need to do that. But yeah, I'm getting a little off track there. But no, that uh, is on. No, it's still spot on because yeah. I, I think <laughs> so, it plays in that's to exactly. recovery. Yeah, absolutely. But I went to the first. The first thing you got to do is you go to a seminar. Um, where, where the surgeon talks to you about the different procedures that they can do and, you know, the outcomes and all that sort of jazz. And, um, and, the, and one of the main things that they talked about was, you know, they wanted you to quit using nicotine, whatever form it was. And now there's, you know, there's red lights going off in my head, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know about all this. You know, so talking with the wife and everything, you know, and like I said, I, I was kind of starting to see myself a little differently. I said, well, you know what, I should quit anyway. I said, this will give me the excuse to quit. So I got online, you know, same stories about everybody else I've talked to, started researching, you know, how you quit chewing, because I had tried before and I'd never really had any success with it. I'd how many years do you have, of 
How many years do I'm you? Uh, how, how many years of addiction did you have up to that point? Uh, well, I was thirty-two, and I started using probably at twelve or thirteen. So, so I okay, had probably well, eighteen, twenty years somewhere in that area. Yep. Yeah, don't worry about the math. D- uh, Dan and I always <laughs> say the math never works out the way it should. Yeah. So it's kind of ballparking anyway. Yeah. So twenty years. Yeah, somewhere in that area. Um, okay. So I got online, I, and I found that site, um, and I, I just got on there, and it was it was that day, the twentieth of December. Well, I got to quit to go through this program if I'm going to follow through with it, and so I posted my day one, and I threw it away, and haven't looked back since. It's been rough, but you know. But back to the weight thing, uh, you have to go to a diet class every month. Um, and the first thing that they do when you go into diet class is you get weight. You have to lose um, 10% of your body weight in the six months leading up to surgery. Hmm. The reason that they explain that to me is because the insurance wants to know that you're serious about this before they're going to pay for this procedure. I always thought it was a little counterintuitive. If I can lose 10% of my body weight, I don't need to have the surgery. <laughs> yeah, I was, gonna, I was thinking the same thing. Well, yeah, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, yeah, it's another one of these, to, do you I'll really want this thing? Yeah, do you really yeah. want to do this? You know, yep. you, you had to jump through some hoops and prove that you're really into this. Exactly. Uh, and it turns the surgery out surgery is not a shortcut. I mean, it's a it's not a shortcut. It's a it's no. an assist. It's like going to rehab for alcohol or something. You know, it's not going yeah. to save you. It's uh, But it will give you an assist. Yeah, but, but losing 40 plus pounds, I mean, that's. That's a big ask. Yeah. It is. And you have to be, I mean, you're you're dedicated to it at that point. If you're gonna do this, then you you know, you either you're all in or you're not. Damn. And I remember the, the, the dietitian looked at me because my first weigh in, official weigh in was January. That was our first diet class and I quit chewing in December. So, you know, in that time I put everything in the house that I had in my face to and I gained fifteen pounds and, and yeah. actually less than a month in about three weeks. Mm-hmm. And she looked at me and she goes, you're not serious about this, are you? I'm like, well, yeah, I'm serious. I said, I just quit chewing. And she pissed me off so much. I got on that site and I, I, I ranted. I mean, you guys know how people rage on there. Yeah. And I raged about how the doctor, you know, you quit smoking and you're, you know, you're a god. There's nothing said about quitting chewing or, you know, and all this other. And I'm trying to explain this to the dietitian. I said, I just quit you. And I said, you know, yeah, I'm eating more than I should be. I'm trying to get through that on top of dieting and exercising. And she just didn't get it. She thought I wasn't taking it seriously. And all that did was just drive me more because she pissed me off. So <laughs> I, I told my wife, I said, come February, I will weigh less than I did in the beginning or else, you know, just to show her. But hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, but yeah, I gained 15 pounds right off the bat. I went from from like 4.30 to the back up to my biggest at 4.45. Goodness. But then I found other ways of coping with dealing with the chewing and and cut back on what I was eating and I started exercising. And then the weight just kind of steadily started to come off. I actually lost more than 10% of my weight by the time I had surgery. Um, Good for you. But the surgery, that six months was hell. Because when you're used to eating five, six, eight thousand calories a day, and then you drop it down to a thousand and exercise on top of it, you are miserable. So where the surgery helps is now you don't have that hunger. <laughs> I mean, so which? I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Which one did you? What what surgery did you end up having? I know there's a number of them. I had a vertical sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, basically, they go in laparoscopically and they remove about 85% of your stomach. Ooh. They don't reroute anything, uh, you know, like a bypass. They, they take out, they create a pouch and they bypass some of your intestines and all that. It's That's a much more riskier procedure. Um, I opted to have the, 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 the sleeve simply because it, it was easier on your body. The recovery time was a lot less. Um, the drawback to the sleeve uh, is, number one, it's a newer procedure. There isn't nearly as much long-term data for it, um, where the bypass, I mean, they've been doing that for decades. Um, 
there's some doctors and surgeons that believe that the sleeve in the long term isn't as successful because you're not bypassing your intestines, uh, which in turn uh, actually changes how malnutritioned you actually are from the surgery. Um, you're not absorbing nearly as much nutrients from your food with the bypass, where with the sleeve like I got, I still absorb everything out of everything that I eat. I actually have to be a little bit more restrictive about my diet than somebody who has a bypass. Uh, the other thing is the, the sleeve, you, you tend to have a lot of acid reflux uh, afterwards, which my wife, even at you know, a year and a half now is still struggling with that a little bit. Luckily, I didn't have that problem, but um, but that's that's what I had. Um, the oh, bypass. So she went, I'm sorry, she just to catch up on that aspect. So she went back and and actually did come through. Uh, oh yeah, yep. and got sur- awesome. Okay. Yeah, we had our surgeries a week apart. Uh, oh, wow. I had mine. I had mine August. Uh, I think August 15th, and she had hers like the 22nd. Yeah. So. Wow. So uh, what kind then, of recovery time do you have with that? Uh, I spent, uh, let's see, I spent two nights in the hospital, and then I came home the following day. Um, well, to put it in perspective, I had mine on the 15th of August. I started my first day of uh, online school the 20th of August. So, I mean, I was able to sit at my computer and work and stuff five days later. Um, it's, it's all That's laparoscopic. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they had us up the day after surgery. We had to get up and walk the, the floor in the hospital and we had to walk so much a day. And, well, um, you know, any kind of thing where you're, you know, any invasive, especially in your, you know, gut, uh, mm-hmm. there's gotta be some, you know, um, uh, anytime you go rearranging a human body, <laughs> there's going to yeah, be some, it's not going to like you very much. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and that's not fun, you know, because at, at the time of surgery, I weighed about 385. So you're walking around, you know, the hospital, you know, wheeling your IV thing around with your your overly extended gut hanging down and pulling on incisions. And, mm. oh, it was, it was horrible. I, the first night I woke up, like, in agonizing pain. And, and I, I told the nurses there, the, the night nurses at the hospital were angels because she had me down timed when she could give me more pain medicine <laughs> i mean she was in there almost when i was waking up to get more pain medicine but yeah the walking around a couple of days afterwards that was really kind of painful so with but, that with that procedure does that come with along with liposuction or no i mean how does no. it lead to long-term weight loss or and and losing all the excess body fat well the the fact the excess body fat, you lose it. Um, now, I have a lot of a lot of loose skin. Um, when you're that big, I mean, my waist at one time was 58 inches. Wow. You know, I wear 32s now. So there's a lot of excess skin. Um, you can uh, – insurance won't pay for that to be removed. That's considered a cosmetic thing. Unless um, it's causing um, some kind of issues. Exactly. Like if you're getting rashes and stuff like that, then because the gal I know only, was able to get some approval on some surgery yeah. and get some uh, mm-hmm. and get some of that taken care of. My it took a fight though. Yeah, my wife's gonna probably have to have you know with uh, having a kid. She had she naturally had that kind of pouch you know to begin with, and then you add on you know all the weight that she lost, and she's she's probably gonna have to have it. So uh, where, where me, was she, where was she at to begin with? If she's if she's okay uh, she, with it, if she's not okay with you saying it, let's skip it. Yeah, no, she's she was at uh, I want to say she was around three three forty three forty five. Yeah, if I'm remembering correctly. So and she, you know, to be honest, and, and she's okay with what we've talked about that she hasn't been um, as successful as me. But everybody's different. You yep. know. I'm the exception to the rule, actually. Yeah, actually. Um, because looking at you, I mean, yeah. I saw some a couple pictures of you, the video of you playing the guitar, and and mm-hmm. you know, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, most people have a a, a a a considerable amount of success, but uh, um, 
at least the pictures I've seen of you, uh, looks like, you know, uh, I, I will, let's just say a hundred percent, you're back down to like what you would, what your frame uh, yeah, really yeah. ought to be. Well, yeah, there's, yeah. there's some statistics The the sleeve is supposed to help you lose 60 to 70% of your excess weight. So if you need to lose 250 pounds, the sleeve is supposed to aid you in losing 60 to 70% of that. I have in, I had mine in August, so this is December, so it's been a year and four months. Wow, roughly. that's amazing. And I am, and I am to my goal weight. And you're like, what do you so, say, buck eighty? Is, it, so is that what you? Um, I go between one seventy five and one eighty. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. And 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 actually, on the BMI scale, I'm still technically overweight. <laughs> How I don't tall think are you? That I'd look. I'm five ten. Yeah. Uh, I don't think, that, and, and my surgeon agrees, you know, we uh, we have to go every year for a follow-up, and I just went here in October, and she agrees, she she doesn't think that I need to lose any more yeah, weight the, than I am, even though Corey did it, but I'm, I'm still muscular, you know, from working so yeah. much, and, and I work BMI out. thing is a little bit of a, yeah. uh, it can be a little bit of deceiving, it's, it's not a solid... Thing. Yeah, I'm yeah. not overly convinced that the math on that I mean, one is it's a, uh, correct either. It's an okay it's, it's indicator, solid. you know. I mean, it's a it's a it's a measurement point. It's a metric that you can look at. But uh, yeah, it wants me at like 155 to 165. And yeah. I just I'm ain't gonna. Yeah, I'm six two and 108. I actually, over, for whatever reason, over some past time, I put on another 15 pounds and then took it back off again. So I'm back down to 180. So six two and 180. I'm a pretty thin dude. And my BMI yeah. says I'm over too, and I'm like bullshit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Bunch of crap. Yeah, if I go down to what they're saying, I should be. I look like I'm on crack. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my last just... girlfriend told me to stop because right? well, I put on yeah. about 25 pounds quitting nicotine, so I was up at about 205, and and I like to be about 180, 185 is about where I feel right. And yeah. uh, and I have been lighter than that. When I when I get lighter than that, I actually start feeling sick. I start I start feeling bad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh and and that that girl told me she said uh yeah it's uh that is enough do not lose any more weight <laughs> well my wife's telling me the same thing i mean she, she makes fun of me all the time i got bones sticking out places that i didn't even know i had bones and yeah you know yeah. it's just my grandma my grandma tells me the other day she goes you know you need to stop losing weight you you don't look healthy and, anymore. and uh, yeah but a lot of it is they're not used to that yet. yep you know, they're not used to seeing me as 180 pounds. They're used to seeing me as 400 and some pounds. Right. So, uh, you know. One of the big things on all this, obviously, is that you got to make some huge dietary changes. If you don't follow yeah. up on the back side of this surgery, I have personally watched people uh, drop a, a ton of weight and go right back, even with the device yeah. and the surgery still intact, and put every single bit of it back on again. Yep. Um, yeah. That's, so talk about that, that nutrition thing and 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 the walk of that kind of what 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 you went through, what not went through, but what what actions did you have to take in order to uh, follow up? Because it's like I said, the surgery is to me like a like the rehab. It gave me five days of sobriety so I could get a head start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it 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 goes along with. You know, the whole purpose of your podcast here, to me, food is an addiction. Yep. Um, and, you know, and I used to say that it wasn't, but it is. Food, in my experience, food was almost harder than chewing to quit. You have to because moderate. you still have to eat. Yep, that's exactly, that's the yeah. one, that's a big thing with addiction is that like for me, I can't moderate my alcohol or drug intake. If I have a little it, bit, I'm going to want more. In the food yeah. world, it is much harder because you must exactly. eat. <laughs> you yeah. must moderate your addiction. I think I mentioned they had us down to um, between 1,000 and 1,500 calories through our diet classes as a diet per day. And when you go from those kind of numbers down to that, you yeah. just you actually go into almost like withdrawal syndromes. You do. Just like you would chewing or anything else. Yep. And the head hunger, you know, when, when you're 400 pounds, when you sit down to watch TV, you're sitting down with a bag of chips or popcorn or candy or something. You know, you don't do that now. Um, your diet, you know, when you go out to eat, you look at your 
your menu differently. You know, instead of going to you know Burger King or whatever and ordering a triple Whopper, you know, I go and order a grilled chicken sandwich now and throw away the bun. <laughs> yeah, hey, eat so, a slice of chicken. Eat the yeah, chicken yeah, pack. yeah. The, the diet, and they're still. I mean, you know, like this time of the year is really hard with you know with Christmas with candy and that kind of stuff. I just bought yesterday Christmas shopping. I bought a little container of chocolate covered pretzels. I love them damn things. <laughs> you have to you have to learn moderation. They don't want us to um, they don't want us to completely not eat anything that's bad for you. They want you to be able to learn to moderate. Yeah. What you what you're going to eat. I mean, when I went for my meeting or my yearly, you know, she said, you know, about the diet for the next couple of months with the holidays. She said, I want you to experiment and have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. See how your body tolerates things. See how, um, you know, because that's another thing I, I forgot to mention that brought into this. This surgery makes you intolerant to things. Yep. Um, I've heard a that lot too. of people can't, a lot of people can't do sweets. I can't do dairy. I can handle cheese, but I can't like drink milk or. Yep, I've heard um, that exact same thing. That uh, I've watched that with my friend Renee and her uh, yeah. uh, becoming intolerant to certain foods. Mm -hmm. I can't eat anything fried, which I'm not supposed to have that in any way. But <laughs> um, the, the uh, grease and stuff just makes me sick. Um, but I've gotten to where, as far as my diet now, I eat the same thing every day almost. Um, for, for breakfast, I have, uh, I, I make a concoction, I call it overnight oats, but it's just oatmeal with protein powder in it, with some dried fruit and almond milk. Um, lunch, I have some form of grilled chicken, whether it be a uh, salad, whether it be uh, with rice, um, and, and it's very small portions. Everything I eat is weighed out, measured. Most people at this stage aren't doing that anymore. I still do all that. Um, I eat, I can tell you, I eat a hundred, between a hundred and 120 grams of protein every meal. Every meal? Um, well, I meant, I, I meant like 120 grams of chicken, which would be my oh, okay. protein. Okay. All right. No, I, as a total for the day, I get between 80 and a hundred grams of protein. Yeah. I was going to say, I was like, wow. Yeah, no, no, yeah. I've actually heard yeah, something that said that if you actually, and this is more information that I have received from, uh, from my friend Renee, uh, that that if you're if if you intake more than 30 grams of protein at a sitting you your most bodies discharge the remainder you only really exactly. absorb about 30 yep so if you're trying to yeah i try to i try really to keep shooting. it yeah i try to keep mine rated at about 30 per meal yep um there's a lot of times i don't even get that much as long as i stay at 80 or around 80 i'm okay yep for the day um and then dinner, dinner is usually some sort of some form of like uh, like fish. I grill a lot, so it's like grilled fish or boiled fish or uh, chicken, shrimp. You know, it, yep. it's our my diet is based around almost pure protein. Right. Um, I eat so little that I eat my protein first, and then I can have a couple bites of whatever I'm having with it. So, you know, if, I, if I'm eating chicken and rice, I'll eat my 120 grams of chicken, and then I might have three bites of rice. Yeah. Um, well, that's uh, when I, when I and, and it's nothing compared to what, you, but it's a long, I, it's the same, I use the same tools that, that I was taught uh, from a friend, is that, you know, I, I, I'm still a firm believer if you're not weighing what you're eating, you don't know what yeah. you're eating. You're uh, exactly right. And that deal of having stuff sitting around in the house where I can just grab a pretzel. Like, I love these big yep. giant sourdough dough pretzels, the big hard ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, two of those blow me. You know, I can't, oh, I, yeah. I, you know, and, and yep. if I just walk by and grab one of them or if I have any other things sitting around where I grab and go. I used to, in my work environment, it seemed like uh, back at my other job, it seemed like in the break room there was always donuts, cookies, cake. Yep any number of other kind of foods just sitting there and to walk through the break room to refill my water and bypass that stuff uh was i mean i, I it was just like patting my pocket for that can of dip yeah. uh my hand wanted to reach for it was like i mean those donuts are sitting there for me uh, yep. Why you mean I can't have one? And uh, yeah, uh, my, and my wife knows all about that. I mean, she works in an office environment, you know, and she deals with this every day. I mean, and people come bring you stuff, you know. They bring in cookies yeah, and they come and yeah. tell you, and they come, oh, come on, you can just have one. 
and uh, yeah and yep. I'm like, no i'm really and the other thing of this if i don't so second to uh you know first was the weighing everything second was recording it if i didn't i used an yep. app and if i didn't actually put that food in an app and this app particularly you know it even had barcode scanner in it where i could actually mm-hmm. if i was buying yep. something i could actually scan the barcode of it and put how many servings i was having and and record every single thing i put in me and uh within my you know and it, you know within by the time i hit my two year or no by the time i hit my one year quit i was back down to my weight that i that i should be on so it was the grabbing the food uh weighing it and recording it otherwise uh, uh there's no way that i could have uh done what i did just by accident yeah yeah and you get to where at least for me anyway i've gotten to where i've done it so much I can pretty much look at something, yeah. but I still don't trust it. You know, I still, I have a scale that stays on my kitchen counter, you know, all the time. I throw the plate on there, zero, and I measure everything I need. Yeah, and I can totally relate with eating a lot of the same things over and over again. Um, When I was doing that, I'd meal prep for my week at work. And on Sunday, I would cook like, um, you know, I would cook, if, if my kids were with me, I'd cook like nine pieces of salmon. And we would eat three of them three or four of them for dinner that night and the other ones would go into packages for my lunches the rest of the week and mm-hmm. so that week i'd have salmon and the next sunday night i might do chicken and i do that many yep. pieces of chicken and do the exact same thing so every day and then i did rotate you know i'd eat something different usually week to week but for that week i pretty much had the exact same thing for lunch every day yep well, a lot of people ask me, how can I eat the same thing every day? Because just like you, every Sunday I cook a family-sized pack of chicken breasts. I cook, like, I bought a rice cooker. I, I cook six cups of rice, you know, and that's my food stuff for the week. How do you eat the same thing every day and not get tired of it? Well, after you have the surgery, you look at food, you learn to look at food a little differently. To me, yeah. it's fuel. Right. As long as it's not something gross that I can't stand to eat, food is fuel. I eat because I have to eat to live. Yeah. So it doesn't matter to me that I'm eating the same thing. It, it works. It's it stays within the boundaries of what I'm supposed to have, and you know, I don't care that it's the same thing. Now there there's days. I mean, we still go out to eat. You know, it was like me buying the pretzels yesterday. I still eat stuff that you know, quote, I'm not supposed to have. Yeah. And you have to do that. Yeah. You, you need to treat yourself a little bit. You exactly. Know? <laughs> There's nobody that that can honestly say that you know they don't ever eat anything they're not supposed to eat. Right. You know, I have pizza. I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of pizza. <laughs> you know, once in a while I'll go have pizza. Or, you know, and there's 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 days that I won't load my food. Um, I I like smoking food. I have a smoker and and that kind of stuff. And I'll make brisket or I'll make ribs or something. And I know the fat content and that stuff is high. The sugar's high with the sauces and all that. And there's just no point in me logging it. I know what I'm eating. You know, but I just know that, you know, okay, it's Sunday. I'm going to watch football and I'm going to eat barbecued ribs. Yeah. Because that's what I want today. But then the rest of the week, you know, I'm back to being strict about what I eat. Yeah. Yeah. That's a real good point, you know, uh, because, you know, a lot of times, uh, I think a lot of times folks think they have to give up everything. You know, that it's, we, we think, it, we tend to think in such a black and white kind of deal. It's like all or nothing. And like, if you and do because, that, you will fail. Yeah. And like in the nicotine and it opened the booze, yes, that's actually the case, you know. But yeah. with the, with the eating, with obviously, uh, that is not the case, you know. And that's exactly no. the point of the black and white that, you know, it, it, it's just not always black and white. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and if you don't treat yourself once in a while, uh, yeah, like you said, you, you will end up, uh, failing. Another thing I watch people do is go on something that is unsustainable. They'll put on some kind of like a, yeah. go to a diet that's like super low calorie where uh, they just you know, they're just not going to be able to to sustain it. Uh, and yep. it is, and you're basically setting yourself up for failure when you when you when you kind of reach that deep into the pocket. Yeah, because yeah, then the body is going to go into like a rubber band effect. Yep. It, it, you're putting it in starvation mode. Yep. Exactly. And it, yeah, it's unsustainable. Yeah, and then so. you'll binge. You'll grab that whole box oh, of yeah. chocolate pretzels, and it'll be gone before you get home. You know, yep. <laughs> or that. Yeah, well, the, the the diet. You know, that's another thing with the surgery. You know, the reason the surgery on in the onset is so because it drops you down to only eating a thousand calories a day without feeling that hunger and that. You know, but that hunger and stuff people don't realize comes back. 
you know, when, when they when they do the procedure that I had, the, the section of the stomach that they remove removes a gland that creates the hunger. I don't hmm. know. The, I know the name of it. I can't say it. Um, too medical for me. But and you actually lose the the feeling of hunger for a while. Now, at about a year, year and a half, that starts to come back. And you have to consciously think to eat in the beginning. Hmm. You, you, you will literally starve yourself if you ate on feeling because you're just not hungry. It's like you're force feeding yourself. I remember telling, uh, telling my surgeon at my one month appointment, I said, this is so counterintuitive. You want me to lose weight, but I have to sit here and force myself to eat. Well, yeah, but you have to be, you know, nutrition too. I mean, you have to have, you know, intake. So, and that was a struggle in the beginning, you know, the whole mind game of I'm supposed to be losing weight, but yet I'm not hungry, but I'm eating. Um, that took some getting used to. <laughs> and, and, and and everything gets better. You, you get into a, a groove, you get into a rhythm, you know. Uh, I, the hunger's coming back a little bit now. I, I, I get a little bit of that, like, head hunger stuff. Um, I keep things... For when that happens, I'll go to the refrigerator and I'll eat some baby carrots or an apple or something like that, you know, instead of reaching for potato chips or you know, popcorn or cookies or, you know, whatever the case might be. Yeah, that brings, up, replace that brings up another point that whenever I did quit the nicotine, I knew that I would be wanting to eat more. I recognized that I'd be wanting to do that. So uh, I started, you know, and I did a really good job of it, of making sure that the things I was putting in me was, I love, I, I'm one of the guys that loves uh, raw vegetables. Uh, cauliflower, broccoli, carrots, celery, you name it, green peppers, all the different peppers. Uh, and I just love that. So I would cut those up and take them with me to work. And yeah. later on, what I realized, it didn't make any difference. 3,000 calories of carrots is exactly the three, same 3,000 3, carrots yeah. of, of cake. Uh, yep. now, yeah, you're not getting the sugar, and you're not, but yep, you're still getting the calories. And, and so I still put on weight, even though I was telling myself I was only eating healthy things. <laughs> you know, here's well, a question for you, Dave. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. I was just well, going to say, the dietitian told us at our first meeting that, you know, when they cut our calories down to 1,500, she said, I don't care if you eat 1,500 calories of lettuce or if you go to McDonald's and buy three Big Macs that equal 1,500 calories. It's the same thing. You can just eat a lot more of the of the other. <laughs> yeah. So, so. okay, D during your post-operative months, um, a lot of people uh, talk about, they, they enjoyed a cigarette or a dip after dinner. Okay, now that your appetite's coming back, is that giving you any... Were, were you an after-dinner dipper slash smoker? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I I don't know. I think because I quit because I quit the nicotine about eight months before I had the surgery, hmm. I think a lot of that was gone by then, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, the big... Okay, so you were far enough along. Okay. Yeah, I, I, that 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 never really was a was a factor for me. Because um, yeah, I'm sure it just like in anything like else with Billy. While, but. Yeah, uh, when, when we talked to Billy, I mean his his was medically driven as well, um, and it 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 seemed like as soon as his procedure was done, the quitting was uh, kind of like a it, it just. It was there, you know. It, it didn't take much effort. Well, it did, but not as much effort as it did other people. So, would you say roughly your quit because of uh, your your post-operative uh, world, your your new food world, if you will, uh, the quit has become easier? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It takes the focus off of it. Now you're focused on your your eating and your exercise regimen and. And you're not focused on on the, on the chew. For me, anyway, that's the way it seemed. Yeah. Well, you know, that um, goes the same way as one for for you know, if you've got some consequences and you got some other like some some diversion, uh, then then yeah, it would uh, it, it maybe easier isn't maybe the right word. Maybe uh, the, yeah. you have been distracted from the nicotine it, quit. Exactly. Yeah, kind of like uh, maybe another. less critical. I, 
Yeah. Yeah, because B- yeah. uh, Billy's deal was a cardiac issue, you know. So I mean, it was oh, okay. it was. Uh, I, I don't know that he was actually told this exactly, but it was something like, "Yeah, quit dipping, or you're getting ready to die." And, uh, <laughs> and, and usually, <laughs> that's but, usually a good motive, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, in my world, in this, uh, in in my in, when I work with a lot of alcoholics and addicts, and when the, the heavier their consequences, actually, the happier I am. Because uh, I want them to have a big heavy motive on top of them. It's like, yeah. man, I got another DUI. They'll yeah, tell me, yeah, I was like, man, that is great. <laughs> yeah, oh, if you don't have nothing to work for, then you're not gonna. But you know, on the, on the other hand, you know, back to the you know the chewing and the addiction part of it, there, to me, there is a little bit of a downside to the surgery, and it's something that I talked to my surgeon about the last time I was in there. The food. <sighs> I almost hate to say this because it's beneficial, but the food is still an addiction. Yep. It's just a, it's an addiction in a total opposite direction. I have gotten to where I probably think and worry about food more than I did before the surgery. Yeah. I'm yep. so conscious about what I'm eating and logging everything. And I told my, and, and I need to find a way to, to moderate that. Even. Yeah. Right. You know, cause so I you- so like that. My wife gets so mad at me sometimes, but um, go ahead. You, you you basically become addicted to recovery from your food addiction. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, I can be found yeah, guilty of that too. I mean, I do a lot. I, I participate in my recovery a lot. Uh, enough to where I really don't have room for anybody in my life at the moment because I do that all the time. Uh, you know, it's inter- you know, the With addiction... In, of any type, some two of the big kickers, you know, it's an attachment. We actually get attached, like mentally yep. attached. It's obsessive, you know. And mm-hmm. then when we divert that, we find that, you know, yeah, even though I'm not doing that anymore, I'm still attached and addic- and obsessed with something else. I will grab for something yep. else. And, you know, the actual deal here is, is usually is to divert that to something healthy. But, yep. you know, then we can also take healthy to extremes also oh, yeah. and, uh, and, and and overdo. We, what the, Our problem is, is that we tend to overdo things and yep. no matter and, what and they are. And, and that's where I'm kind of at right now. You know, you, uh, uh, Jim was doing, you know, the Fury Fitness thing there yep. uh, in November that I was trying to be, that I was a part of for a little while. And until I got to where I wanted to be and I didn't want to lose any more weight and then I had to, you know, I'm trying to learn to moderate all that. But it, it's gotten to where it, my health, as healthy as that is, is unhealthy. Yeah. In that I, 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 I focus too much on, but I'm so afraid of getting back to the way I was or, you know, or, or failing, I guess, you know, I, that I, I just, I don't know, it's actually kind of hard to put into words. Well, I remember my friend hitting the point where she was needing to start, instead of on the loss end of things, she needed to start where she was on a maintenance, where she needed to and do just enough to maintain where she was yeah. at. And yeah. that was and terribly difficult for her uh, as she hit that maintenance area, uh, because the scale still said, you know, not in, that's a whole other thing, but I'm talking about the food scale said, you know, and she could actually, you know, she needed to eat a little more in order to maintain, yeah. because she's very, very active. And uh, and and was doing, you know, she'd become a yoga teacher by then, and she's doing a ton of that, and she needed more calories, but her head would not, like, register yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, I remember seeing on the group me thing, you know, about I was doing the treadmill and all that, and I've totally stopped until, until I can get things evened out a little bit, you know, because it was just, you know, I reached my, I, I reached my goal weight, and, you know, I went and seen the doctor, and she's like, "Well, you need to, you know, consume about three or four hundred more calories a day, and actually slack off on the exercise until you see where your body is going to like even out." And now it's probably not something you expected to hear, right? (laughs) Yeah, no. I mean, she still wants me to obviously be active and everything, but she doesn't want me doing, you know, because I was. And once again, we have to learn to moderate. (laughs) Yeah, for the fitness thing, I was doing half an hour on the treadmill every morning. Usually I do it every other day, and then I lift or do some sort of activity on the off days. So were those and your primary uh, exercise and fitness routine thing? Was the treadmill and weightlifting? Primarily, yeah. Uh, I did more cardio than I did weight training, simply because I have um, 
I, I, I was a pretty stout muscle wise from doing all the labors working and everything. I didn't I, I didn't want to be like a bodybuilder because I know with that muscle comes appetite. I was okay with losing some muscle during this process. Yeah. Where somebody who's a normal normal build muscular would lose more than they should. If that makes sense. Yep. I had enough that what I lost didn't really affect me in that regard. So I didn't focus a lot on, on weight on weights. I did more cardio than, um, than anything. Mainly just walking and running and biking. Um, at first, we when I first started exercising and stuff, I'd just go out and walk. You know, I'd walk two or three miles. And they got to where I was walking six and eight miles. And, <laughs> you know, now I you know, run for, you know, 45 minutes and, and bike and everything else. But I, I've pretty much stopped doing all that right now until I can get everything to kind of even out. So let me throw some because, other little, um, at some... Um I guess maybe more esoteric issues around this thing. Uh, one of the things I've heard people say is that once they lost all that um, that that insulation around them, that that they actually feel a bit more vulnerable in the world. Almost like that that insulation was a uh, was a that 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 padding almost was like a a barrier to allowing people to get close to me it it made people like stay away and that's kind of something i didn't that i wanted did you have any of that kind of experiences any of that maybe relate in uh, i don't know if it's the same thing i think i my confidence is, is better now because i don't have that self-image in myself do you still look at yourself uh, as a big guy and uh oh, yeah, like maybe if yeah. you're gonna maybe what uh here's one of the things uh my friend would uh, walk across maybe a bridge that looks suspect, you know, maybe not oh, not yeah, real. Yeah. And, and today she can go across it without no problem, you know, with that worry is actually not there. Yeah. But in her head, she still worries, is that thing yeah. going to hold me? Or the same thing about like sitting in a chair going, hmm, yeah. is that chair going to hold me? And even though I'm down yeah. in a way that it doesn't matter anymore, my head still tells me that I need to be cautious oh, yeah. about those things. Yeah, that's that's definitely a thing. Uh, I just told my wife for a while ago, we were sitting on a bench at the mall, I said, you know, what is the self-image of yourself? I know what I look like looking in the mirror. But when I think of myself sitting on this bench in this mall, I'm picturing, you know, this big guy wearing baggy cargo pants because it's the only thing I could find that would fit my ass that day. You know, that's what I see. You know, when you were talking about the bridge thing, uh, we went on vacation last year and ended up going to an amusement park. I used to not be able to fit on the rides. Right. You know, and now it's just like I get on and there's room. Like, I'm kind of scared, you know, that <laughs> the thing's not going to hold me where it's supposed to be because I'm actually small now, you know. That that image of what I am, yeah, sure. That, and that's something that I'm kind of struggling with a little bit. Yeah, that's going a, back to going back to the the evening things out thing. You know, in my brain, I'm still in losing mode. I should still be losing weight, and everybody's telling me that I'm I'm skinny and this and that, and you know, I'm kind of struggling with all that a little bit. Um, clothes is another thing. You know, I used to go in the store and I was disappointed because I'd see something that I liked and it didn't come anywhere near big enough. I have a problem now. I go in the store and a lot of stuff I look at and like doesn't go small enough. <laughs> yeah. And that's just that just blows my mind. Right. Yeah. yeah that's that's what I mean about the 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 little side things that you wouldn't really think of most most normal. <laughs> that's not the correct word yeah. either. But most well, let's just say yeah. normal people would not have normal that people, issue going yeah. in a store, you know, and thinking that, or sitting on the bench, or worrying about getting on the ride at the amusement park, or like the with my friend. The one time I walked across the log uh, that was going across a little creek, you know, so we didn't we wouldn't get our feet wet, and she's worried about the log being able to hold her. And and just the 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 little the little things that are still in your head where you pictured and that's I think that's part of that body dysmorphia thing I think is what they call it is that yeah. you don't see your your head tells you you are not who you are physically. Yeah, and, but with good reason. I mean, you know, I spent thirty two years being overweight, you know, and you know, and now just the last year and a half, two years, you know, I guess I'm expecting my mind to just switch. You right. Know, and, it ain't gonna work that quick. Yeah, you know, and it works. It, it goes the opposite direction too. Um, the whole reason I did Fury Fitness, you know, the thirty days of Fury Fitness, was mm -hmm. because I was seeing 
I was seeing who I've always been because in the army I had to be in shape. You know, well, I yeah, had, yeah. I, I could not uh, let yourself gain. Go. Yeah, I couldn't let myself go. Uh, I, now, granted, I was so damn active, I could eat whatever I wanted. Well, yeah, you know. But then, you know, I left that environment. Then I was no longer, you know, I went to work in construction. And I could, I was still so active, I could eat whatever I wanted. Then I became, in, you know, I came to management. Then I quit. And I still saw myself as being the, the thin, in-shape guy. Yeah. Despite the fact that the mirror was telling me something different, yeah, and, and that's at why the same I, time your uh, metabolism took a swing too, because it, I think right, you, yeah, you and I are it all of a sudden goes from being able to eat anything you want to all of a sudden no longer can you actually do that and still maintain yeah. your weight. Right. So I was hiding from the scale too. I, I didn't want to weigh myself. And then it was just at the end of October, I I braved it. I got on the scale. And then I took a real hard look in the mirror and went, "Wow, that yeah. I, this is not the guy. That I'm not. Who is this person? You know." So, and then I your know exactly your knowledge, saying. yeah, it, I, your knowledge uh, definitely helped me through the uh, the Fury Fitness. At the end of that thirty days, I lost eight pounds, and mm-hmm. it's has hey, stayed that's... off. Yeah, because here's the thing: you can lose weight too fast, and it's not healthy for, to do that either. You know, they yeah, recommend it, you lose for a normal. We're going to use that word "normal" again. Yeah, the normal person who wants to lose, you know, twenty, thirty pounds, even. You know, if you're losing one to two pounds a week, you're doing good. Yeah, that's what I was always told to target to set my. Yeah, you're you not going to be those like. Little- you can set those apps and you put in your data and everything and you put yeah. in there how much do you want to lose yeah. a week and then it feeds you back how much you should be eating. Uh, I was losing 10, 15, sometimes 20 pounds a month. Yeah. But, you know, but that's a little that's different too. That was under a medical yeah, that's, supervised that's totally deal, you know, yeah. and, uh, and and frankly, and I'm, I think I'm right here, uh, from a percentage standpoint, it still ends up being about the same. You're losing about the same percentage of body weight a month as as I would if I'm losing one to two. It, it's close. Yeah. I mean, it's still really, it's still considered really high. Because what will happen is, and I actually have this problem, um, you'll you're, you'll uh, develop, um, what do I want to say, in your gallbladder stones Yeah. from rapid weight loss. Like, I actually kind of have it now. Hmm. Um. I didn't know that, you know, I was, I was running here this summer and I kept getting this pain in my side and ended up going to the doctor and everything. Well, here I'm, I'm developing stones in my gallbladder and because of the rapid weight loss, somehow it does, it, it'll create that. Eventually I'm going to have to have my gallbladder re- removed because of it, but, um, which is, you know, some people would consider another downside to having this surgery. There's a good chance that, you know, you're going to have stones and, Luckily for my wife, she had hers removed before her surgery. So, well, the fact of the matter is, you know, that is a very small price to pay because it ultimately, is, yeah. I don't know if you if you got to the point where you started experiencing. Uh, I have friends who are carry a lot of weight who have a hell of a lot of joint problems. You know, their ankles oh, yeah. and their hips and their they just weren't. Yep. You know, we weren't built to carry around that much weight all day long, and you wear your parts out. Oh, yeah. uh, I broke and, my ankle twice at work, the same ankle. Oh, goodness. And then I put a bunch of weight on, and um, I, I couldn't. When I, when I first started walking and hiking and doing that stuff to start losing weight, my ankle, I mean, I was on Vicodin. <laughs> you know, I was on a lot of shit, you know, just to, just so my ankle would hold up to what I was doing. So how, how are your knees weight. and hips? My knees and hips are always good. I never had an issue with them. My back, on the other hand, um, my back's kind of bad, but I fell at work. I fell off the roof years ago and hurt my back and shit but um that hasn't really changed much but um knees and hips were good the ankles was always a problem i'd walk for five or six miles and my ankles the next day i just about couldn't walk on it now i can go hike through the woods 10 miles and act like there's nothing wrong so um so yeah the, the joints and stuff is definitely an issue when you're bigger yeah, you mentioned earlier that you were facing uh, uh, sleep apnea. Has that improved with your weight loss? Yeah, I'm completely done. Uh, I don't use the CPAP machine or anything now. That's completely gone. Yeah, that's another. Uh, my one. wife is the same way. My wife was. Uh, she was. She actually had it worse than I did. She's off of her machine. 
Um, she's no longer diabetic. She was diabetic. Um, it, it cleared that up. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of good benefits to to losing that much weight. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say. I mean, I mean, just by nature of being that big, I mean, your body on all fronts was being basically beating itself up. Yeah. yeah. Over time. I mean, for lack of a better, yeah, for lack of a better analogy, it, it just, uh, it, you, you've come out the other end in a much better place. Oh, yeah, yeah, health-wise and everything else. I mean, like I said before, my dad was a little bit of a motivator for this. You know, looking at my dad's health, would you guys know my dad was just in the hospital. Um, you know, look at my dad's health, you know, and my dad's always been big like that. And a, a good amount of his health issues is due to his weight. Yep. But and, uh, you know, just, you go in the doctor and uh, and and they tell you over and over and over again. But we uh, walk out of there, yeah. or we just quit going. Well, I, was I just the, didn't go. Yeah, I just yeah. I'm not going to go there and hear the news that I don't want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. The doc <laughs> says, "Well, you you definitely need to lose 20 pounds," and you walk out here and yeah, I can stand and lose a pound or two. Yeah. I wish yeah. He, I wish he'd yeah. get off my ass. Uh, I'll well, never, I'll never was, come back here again. Yeah, my whole thing was I was working. I was doing you know hard laborious work at 300 pounds. I mean, I don't mean to put people down, but at 300 and 350 pounds working with the Amish, there's not too many people that I couldn't outwork. Right. Even in, even in that shape. Rationalization you know, and, and justification. Exactly. You know, in my brain, I'm going, well, I can't be that bad out of shape. I mean, I can go work with these guys for 10 hours a day. You know, where most normal sized people, you know, would be done by noon. And those are exactly the things that tell me about like how much related, um, you know, and I, I'll, I'll divert just a little bit, is that we have all these 12-step fellowships that deal with certain issues, OA, Overeaters Anonymous, and, and AA and NA, and everybody kind of points fingers at the other group like it's something <laughs> yeah. different. And, uh, and, and frankly, it's all very much the same, you know, and I hear these same kind of things like, you know, um, I tell myself that because I had, you know, a, a, a nice home, two cars in a garage. I've held a job for a long, long time. Uh, to you know, I have all this. Look at all this that I have. There's no. I don't have a pro. People that have all that don't have a problem. And, yeah. and I heard you say, you know, I'm out working everybody on a job site. You know. Yeah. So don't don't tell me this is a problem. I got you know. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm okay. Uh, yep. And we'll do just about anything. And that's that. That's that uh, we call it in our world a peculiar mental twist where our thinking is is cranked to support the continued habit in the nicotine world we call it the Nick bitch uh, just in yeah. general you know it, it is this it is frankly this mental disease of addiction that actually changes your thinking it actually has you telling yourself lies oh, yeah. in order to continue the behavior uh and and that another you know that is a keystone of this thing being an addiction let me ask you this did you ever uh, hide food did you ever sneak food uh no i never really had that problem because we was all big eaters anyway okay you know, we, one of the things uh, that I've heard, I never really did that. one of the uh, couple of the stories that really hit home to me as I was getting clean sober and listening to my friend's story was that she would like order pizzas from, you know, two or three different pizza delivery places in a night mm -hmm. because she didn't want to, you know, you, oh uh, yeah, one person oh, ordering three pizza. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've never hit, but I've been ashamed. I mean, I used to go into, you know, I'd go into like Ar Arby's is one of my favorite places to eat. <laughs> I'd go into Ar Arby's and I'd order that big beef and cheddar, and then I'd order, oh, yeah. you know, another one on top of it, and one of their gyros, and, and it was embarrassing. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I used to, you know, go to the, go to the Golden Corral, and you're up at the buffet, you know, six times. Yeah. And you know, you're watching the waitress take, you know, trays of plates off your table. Yeah, that's that part I can relate to 100. percent Yeah, that it's happens with pretty much any. I, in my experience. Pretty much any addiction, when you start to realize that you've got a problem, you're not admitting it, but you you're 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 kind of feeling yeah. it. It's like okay, I'll buy a case of beer at this Seven Eleven, and since I know that's not going to be enough, I'm going to go to the Safeway five minutes down the road and buy another case. That way, I'm not toting around two. Yep. Yeah, I would, you know, uh, bounce around different liquor stores, so I wasn't necessarily an all the time dude at the same one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I did. I, I hid my liquor all over the place. I had stashes in the house. 
uh, because I yeah. didn't want my, my wife to see how much I was drinking. I wanted to look like I was drinking the same beer all night long. Yeah, yeah, yeah and the, all, and throwing the garbage bags away in a dumpster uh, down the road so yeah. it wouldn't be yeah. obvious. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah, and on the liquor front, when I was younger, I used to drink a lot. I mean, I drank a lot. I mean, I never, I, well, I don't know, my wife says I probably had a problem. I never considered it a problem. And to this day, to be honest, as much as addicting things with the snuff and, and the food, I still don't consider alcohol to be one of my my issues but, yeah but i think i've heard um, you say too that the uh, empty calorie issue is probably the empty maybe cal- on top yeah. of that yeah but i mean as far as a, a drinking problem goes i don't consider myself because some probably would but uh you know e- even now i mean go along with the surgery people don't realize that the surgery changes how you consume alcohol you can't drink like you used to you know, I would, me and my dad would sit, you know, on a Saturday afternoon and go get, you know, the big, I don't know what, half gallon or whatever it is of Jack Daniels. And we'd sit and drink that whole thing in a day. You know, yeah. I feel fine. We drank all day. You know, we we'd drink, shoot guns, build shit, you know, whatever. You know, and now, you know, I go out, we went to a Christmas party Friday night and I had one drink of Jack and Coke and I was, you know, I was kind of buzzed a little bit. Yeah. So we you're, bodied, what you're saying is you're a cheap date. <laughs> yes, I'm very cheap. Yeah, yeah, because I eat half of a meal and <laughs> I have one drink. And, um, but and, and and the reason is because I'm not 450 pounds. It doesn't take nearly as much to, you know. Yeah, like a blood to get me to that point. I mean, I still every once in a while, I'll still you know, I'll have a glass of wine or a drink or something if I'm out. But to me now, it's more of a nutrition thing. I just don't want the empty calories. Yeah, and, yeah. There's Plus, if you did try alcohol. and drink the way you used to. Since you don't have the body fat, your BAC is going to spike, and you oh could probably God, yeah. drink yourself into a coma if you were yep. able to yeah, drink but, as much as you used but, to, right? But what's funny, is, well, yeah, but what's really funny is, and this kind of goes along with, with your podcast a little bit on the 12 steps thing, is this another drawback to these types of surgeries are that they have a tendency to create alcoholics. Yep, that's what I was just saying. People will oh. they will substitute. They will change over. Well, and, not not just because of that. Going back to your self image thing again, you get people who who now they feel good about themselves. You know, they're 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 quote skinny. They start going out. Okay, they find that they can't drink nearly as much as they can, so they become blitzed a lot easier. <laughs> And in turn, they end up actually becoming alcoholics. The social life starts to get to them a little bit. They, you know, and it doesn't take nearly as much to get them to drink. And just like any other thing, you know, with addiction, you know, it might take a little bit at the beginning, but as you go on, you start needing more and more and more. And with us, what'll happen is all the empty calories will start putting the weight back on, which in turn makes people sometimes get depressed and drink. It it ends up being a rabbit hole of, I call it the rabbit hole of failure almost. Yeah. Yeah. The vicious cycle. Yeah, the vicious cycle of you know what one what one little thing causes. Yeah. I mean, luckily I'm you know I'm married with a kid. I don't go to bars and shit anymore. I drink at home if I'm going to have a drink. But but that is a big concern with people who have the surgery is their inability to drink causes them to become more more like alcoholics. You know? Yeah, I know it's one person important. specifically who uh, drank themselves to death after the surgery, lost the weight, and, yeah. and a couple of life things happened, and uh, I don't, you know, I can't hang it on the exact hook that you just spoke of, but it was, uh, it was much, it was it was very closely related, and, and she, mm-hmm. she actually drank herself to death. Wow. Uh, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a very serious, you know, and that's, that's part of the reason why I, I don't drink nearly like I used to, because I know that, you know, it doesn't coincide with the healthy lifestyle that I'm trying to live, for one. And two, it just, it, 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 it creates more problems. Yep. Yeah. It's well, good you once know, in a while. But. You, you make that huge uh, sea change in your life or a uh, complete revolution and, uh, and then things that are not in line with that new trajectory just don't make sense anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. like, you know, it's just, if you, you it's contradictory to, uh, I mean, it's the same reason why I quit dipping was because I made this big change in my life. And one day I sat down and I'm like, man, I'm still doing this. 
Uh, yeah. Let's yeah. put that down. And, you know, and, and there's been a few other things, you know, to, that I have stopped doing because it's just not in alignment with the direction I'm wanting to take my life. Yeah, and, and it doesn't have to be limited to substances. I mean, Dan, nope. you've said it a million times. You know, this, this negativity I don't need or this negative energy I don't need. So I'm putting this yep. aside. I don't, I don't want this anymore. Uh, so you're yeah, picking you're, and choosing the different environments, people, and, and activities, right? Yep, yeah, that I'm going to allow right. myself to be exposed to. But just like anything else, you know, the, the food addiction thing goes along with the alcohol and everything else. You know, you, you get around people who don't understand that you've changed things. You know, some of my family is kind of like that. You know, we gather around food, you know, not just us. As Americans, we gather around food. As a holiday. as a species. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've gathered as around a, food since we couldn't make exactly. words and around a cave in a campfire in a, ki- in a freshly killed animal. <laughs> Yep. So so now you know you're sitting around Ooh, your family I need for holidays, <laughs> and they're expecting you know to have this big plate of you know Thanksgiving dinner or whatever. And you're picking, and you know it'll create some. You know, my dad used my dad was telling me, oh, you can have a little bit of it. No, I'm choosing not to. Yeah, I can physically have it. It's not one of the things that makes me sick, but I'm not going to have it. You know, because I'm choosing not to have it. Yeah, and, and there's that's so- something that some people struggle with. Yep, it almost feels like, and I don't really think it is necessarily conscious, but it's almost a nudge to where when somebody else is, a lot of times what it'll be is somebody else that's not following that same path uh, has a tendency to kind of want to sidetrack your path. And yeah, I don't think exactly. they're doing it in any kind of like, um, I, I don't think it's malicious, necess- way. malicious way at all. Uh, yeah. It's it's the same kind of thing as that, like that, that mind, that, that, that mental twist that causes them to say, hey, like I remember being at a Christmas dinner with uh, my friend one time and some, bought some overweight uncle walks by and made and said, hey, did you weigh that before you ate it? You know, just made just that shitty comment, you know, and and, yeah. and, and she's like, what? <laughs> who would ask anybody that in any yeah, other situation, what? right? Yeah, uh, exactly. No, it, 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 and my and my family is supportive of everything that I've done, you know. But there are that there is that little couple things that you know they, and like you said, it's not them being malicious. It's it's just, I think it's the mindset, you know. And I think they're used to seeing me, you know, three plates for Thanksgiving. Or, yeah. You know, and now I sit down with you know one of the little dessert plates, you know, with a spoon of this, a spoon of that, and that's dinner, you know. Yeah, let, let me ask you this question, Dave, since we're kind of going down that the direction of interaction with people outside of your recovery path. Right. Um, mm-hmm. For alcoholics, it's being around people that are still drinking for uh, yeah. some nicotine addicts. It's being around people that still smoke and dip. And set their spit bottle on your desk while you're sitting at work. Oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> who, who, who was that again? That was, oh, a, that was a Marshall spoke said yeah, that yeah. guy come in and set his spit bottle right on his desk. I <laughs> Marshall's not that guy's. Ass. And Marshall's never even been a dipper. I don't. I don't think so. But it was still that that element of that same. He knew it was the same chemical. Yeah. Oh God, spit so, bottles. My so whole, go ahead. My whole theory. My whole theory on spit bottles was if you if you ain't mad enough to swallow it, you shouldn't be chewing. Yeah. Oh, oh. With Copenhagen, you are a brave man. Yeah. yeah. I swallowed that. Shit. I didn't. Spit. So you were saying, Jim, as far as that being around oh, in environments. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, in, in the fury, you know, uh, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a hamburger addict. Well, I've, well, I've not, noticed. Yeah, I, I love I love my hamburgers, right? <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll say aficionado, it. but anyway, does that with, with, with that constantly being pitched around on the board, does that make you uncomfortable? How do you cope with that if you even need to cope with it? It's nothing I have to worry about, to be honest. It's I, I'm so, I guess stubborn and bullheaded that you know seeing pictures and discussions of hamburgers and that kind of stuff it doesn't bother me. If you watch any TV at all, you're going to be in none day. Yeah, exactly. You, you learn real quick that, you know, food is still a temptation for things, but you also learn how to, you know, just basically ignore it. 
Yeah, because a, co- a picture like of a before. beer, a picture of a drink doesn't bother me at yeah. any level. Now, where where a line can be crossed is, is if I'm actually in an environment and I can be around people who are drinking, but there is well, a that's shift. That's totally in, different. There's a shift, <laughs> and I can be around that until the shift happens, and where where it changes for me is when the shift happens from drinking to drunkenness. When it when it flips that little coin uh, and and it turns, and I can see it plain as day. Uh, when it changes to that, then I start becoming, yeah, my time here is up and time for me to head someplace else. Yeah, staying at the party yeah. too long, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can okay. I can relate to that with a start, if you want to call it diet. But you you know, know, if, you're around, if you're around the stuff and have access, you know, kind of going back to what you were saying about, you know, the office environment, it's a lot harder if you're actually around it. You know, looking at pictures and discussions about, you know, Food and stuff is one thing, but actually, you know, sitting beside a, I, I used to have a, a special place in my heart for donuts. <laughs> you know, sitting beside a box of donuts, you know, that's a little different. Yeah. Now, yeah. You, now you're talking about willpower. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like so, holiday time, like you were saying, you know, it tends to be that like the food spread just sits out, you know. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. all. Yeah, that's what I was going to bring that up. Because I would walk by and I'd say, oh, I'll get me another spoonful of that stuffing. And I'll, why don't I grab a but handful? But you know what? Here's how you handle that, though. And, for that one day, that's perfectly fine. That's exactly what I do on holidays. And that would go against everything that you would think as far as dieting goes. On holidays, I eat what I want when I want to eat it, and I don't care. Huh. But it's one day. Yeah. You know what? You, you did know, say I, that as one of your tidbits of advice to me uh, during the, the Fury Fitness days. Was yeah. you, you, you were allowed to have that day. Jim, yeah. go ahead and take that day. That's right. Because you're obviously not going to eat all the calories required to gain multiple pounds in a day. I never really thought about the math. Mathematically, I put this on Fury. I'm going to put it out here for anybody who's listening. It takes 3,500 calories to equal one pound of fat. Okay? So if you want to lose a pound of fat, you have to have a 3,500 calorie deficiency. If you want to gain a pound of fat, you have to have that in excess. You can't eat enough. It's physically impossible in one day. It's actually physically impossible in two days. You'll gain water weight, but you won't gain actual weight to gain actual poundage or to even lose actual poundage. So you having one day of, you could eat pure shit all day, and it's not going to make a difference. Now, where it becomes the issue is people will take that and turn it into a habit. You know, they'll have the one day and they'll say, well, another day's not going to hurt me. Or, yeah, you know, just okay, one more. Now, now after New Year's, I'll get back to eating better and you've ate for a week. Well, now you are adding poundage. Yep. You can eat what you want for that day, but realize that when that day's over, you're back to, you know, eating what you're supposed to be eating. And they're, like I said, you'll gain water weight if you weigh yourself every day, which I do. You'll also learn how your body fluctuates, but, um, but you can't gain enough in that day. So I eat what I want. You know, I'll um, eat all. I'll snack all day. You know, on holidays. I have a little mantra that was taught to me as I walk around and look at food that's not mine, and I just and and it was taught to me was that is not my food. Uh, yeah. When I walk yeah. by the break room and there's donuts out there, that is not my food. Yeah. That is not my food. Yeah, lucky for me, I was. Um, I was fortunate enough going through this process that I didn't have that temptation. I, uh, I'm, in, I'm in school. I, I study at Penn State online. Um, I stay at home all day. I'm basically a stay-at-home dad who's in school. So, you know, my temptation is whatever's in the house, and I don't allow a lot of things here. So um, I don't have that temptation, and that, that's made it easier for me. We're like my wife working in the office setting. You know, she's around stuff. They order out. They, you know... Um, and I was lucky in that regard. I didn't have to fight that kind of temptation every day. I mean, I just had what was here. So, and that, and that in turn has helped me a lot. I mean, if I had the same kind of temptation that a lot of the people have, I may not have been as successful as I've been, you know? So I like to think I would have, I I tend to think I'm (laughs) hard-headed, you know, stubborn about shit, but, um, but the truth is, I don't know, I probably wouldn't have been as successful if I'd have had you know, access to something every day, all day long like that. So. I, uh, that friend of mine had uh, come down to a plateau and couldn't really get past it. And uh, no matter what she was doing, she couldn't 
couldn't get get past a certain level and uh and i'll just tell the story it, it sounds a little bit like trumpet blowing but i'm gonna do it anyway uh she saw me walk through the 12 steps and and what happened to my life as i did that and she joined uh oa and began to operate under that and uh actually came down to what that that she credited that with bringing her down to her goal uh yeah. that uh had you ever considered any kind of fellowship, any kind of do you do you engage in any kind of support group whatsoever? Uh, no, not now. Um, when we first started the whole weight loss thing, it was a requirement. You had to go to three support groups before they would allow you to have the surgery. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, yep. I, I think that that would be a very useful tool. I've just never needed it. Okay. Um, uh, the wife you... and I kind of have our own support group, to be honest. I mean, right. we're both doing the same thing. So. Yep. yep, that's very valid. Yep. Uh, it's one of the kind of things, I, another one of these little phrases that I picked up along my travels, is, and it goes for nicotine and the dope in the booze, is that I could never do this, but we seem to be able to. Yeah. So, uh, you know, anytime... Yeah, I mean, somebody, obviously, I I use the site to quit chewing, so I'm obviously, you know, I'm all for, you know, having support and that kind of stuff. It just, yeah. Have you ever had the opportunity to, like, uh, share your story in a way like has the, um, you know, around here they have some dedicated, the, the, the medical community, a couple of the different big hospitals that are in the area have, uh, you know, weight loss institutes, basically, or something to that effect. I'm not sure if that's exactly the way they name themselves, but they actually have people who have had success with it come in and speak to others who are uh, investigating uh, changing their lives. Have you ever had any opportunities in the uh, last not on a, like that? Not, not on a formal standpoint. I mean, I think that, you know, I could go to, I mean, we're welcome at the, you know, the support groups, you know, anytime because we're bariatric patients that have never done it. Um, I would say that this is probably the first time I've ever really sat and talked about it to uh-huh. anybody outside of family. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, I was I just going to say, congratulations. This is that opportunity. So, yeah, this is one yeah. thing for sure. <laughs> um, I did talk to a, a nurse while my dad was in the hospital. Um, I was down in the cafeteria getting a uh, bite to eat for lunch, and I was uh, I ordered something that came with a bun and all that. I said, you know, I don't want the bread or anything. I'm a very active patient. And, and she's, oh, would you mind talking to somebody? And she went and got a co-worker and, uh, who was just starting the process. So I did talk to her for about uh 15 minutes or so you know about you know what 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 to expect you know the success that my wife and i had my wife was there too uh and and that was really other than family that was the first person i ever talked so um about it so on a on a formal thing no i've never done anything like that Um, i've thought about doing it i'm just not a real social person (laughs) to to be honest I, i had to really you know, I really had to think and, you know, even agreeing to this, I'm just not much of a social, I don't say much, I'm sure you guys can see in the group me thing, I'm not always real chatty or, um, I don't know, I'm just, I, understand. I, I don't, I, I don't know if I'd feel in a room with live, you know, with people right there in front, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I could do it, you know, this, this to me is different, I can handle this. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm used to doing this through school, though. I mean, with distance learning, you're doing this all day. But right. Well, you uh, seem very comfortable doing it, and yep. I, I think everybody that's listening, or, or will be listening, uh, they're, they're going to be better for it. Uh, you oh, shared a lot of right. a lot of very relevant items to all manner of recovery. Um, yep. And yeah, uh, hey, if I can help somebody, that's you know, that's that's the whole goal. I mean, that's what I was getting ready to say. You know, um, what I found is that. You know, ever we 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 pass from from as long as uh, we've been putting things in writing. What, the way we've done that is by telling one another stories uh, that has come down from from the ages. That that's the Bible. That's everything. That, yeah, that's exactly. just a book of stories. And uh, and this podcast is the is this uh, time in 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 space uh it's it's the way stories are told today and 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 somebody out there will benefit from hearing yours i can assure you that there's somebody out there that needs to hear this that's like sitting on the edge or wondering if they can do it too and should they yeah. and 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 they'll hear a, a, um, your story and it'll give them hope uh that that they can do it too and that's that's uh, in my world we call that carrying the message 
and mm. it's how uh, it's how people uh, it's how people learn today. <laughs> it's how a lot of yeah. people have learned yeah. forever. The only other thing that you know I, I would kind of like to add, and this isn't to you know to chat or change. To, to change anybody's mind by no means I, I i there isn't a day that i have ever regretted doing what i do but this is also kind of my disclaimer and i said this to the to that nurse that i talked to understand that you know for, for the folks who hear my story and whoever i may talk to that like i said earlier my results to this have also kind of been the exception too yeah don't expect that, you know, in a month and four months that everybody's going to be at their goal weight. And, you know, the success that I've had has been due to, one, I, I don't have a job. I, I can, you know, work out for two hours a day. And, you know, um, you know, I can just schedule my school around when I want to go work out, you know. And that's part of the difference between my wife and I. My wife works, you know, every day, and she can't do the stuff that I did. It's not for lack of trying or lack of motivation. She just can't do it. And that's where my little disclaimer for all this comes in. I I work my ass off to get to where I'm at. Yep. Um, but not everybody can do that. Exactly. Not everybody can do that. And everybody needs to, I guess, understand that, you know, there are exceptions to the rule on everything. Yep. Fact um, remains, though, um, you may not do it in the same timeline. Uh, but you it will. It is possible you, to it, it is. make a huge change in your life and 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 do this thing if uh, if, exactly if you want right. to. If you, if you put, yeah, that that take, was that take was the my action. next. That was my next thing. You know, get the motivation, get it in your head that this is what you want to do because it's just like every other from chewing to drink, everything else. You're not going to be successful at it if you're not ready to do it for yourself. Yep. Bingo. You know, if, Bingo. If you're doing it for somebody else, it ain't going to work. Yep. It, yep. Even if you have the surgery, it's not going to work. Yep. That's pretty global so, among all addictions until you're ready. You know, I hate to say it, and it's a little, it's another little cliche, but uh, if you're not ready, uh, it's not going to work. Yep. You have to be yeah, actually but, ready to take the action. And, and then the backside of this whole thing is, yeah, I have to make a decision to do it, but then I have to follow it up with some action. And that action is not easy. Uh, that action oh, takes some not. work. It takes some commitment, some dedication, uh, perseverance. It, 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 and, and you have to follow it up with that. There's a so lot of think uninformed about people. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Finish your thought. Uh, there was, th there's a lot of uninformed people that think this surgery is the easy way out to lose weight. Right. And it is not. Yep. I mean, it, yeah, sure, it makes it easier, but it's a tool. Yep. You, know, yep. you, you still have to do the work and you know, put in what you want out of it. Yeah, my friend yes. would always get uh, accused of like cheating because yeah, exactly. she was able yeah, to have the cheaters. surgery. You know, that it really doesn't count. Yeah, you lost all that weight, but I'm going to discount your achievement because you cheated. And yep. that's a bunch and of that bullshit. Pisses me off. Yeah, that's a that bunch of bullshit. <laughs> and think about what yeah. you've done uh, from a. I, I'm going to tie this back into uh, what my my specialty is, and that's always the nicotine. Um, my my first question to any quitter is, you know, why are you quitting, right? Is this yeah. quit yours, or is this for somebody else? Exactly. Your, your success on the quit was that your, your quit was not just for you. It was a prerequisite to something else that you knew you had to do. Yeah, but at yeah. the same time, what I mean, surgery, major stressor, change in lifestyle, major stressor. You've already got medical issues, major stressor, right? All plus these I was things start, that plus I was starting school. <laughs> right? Okay, school, major stressor, <laughs> loss of job, major stressor. Yeah, um, yeah there's a lot that happened there for. <laughs> yeah, the for odds, while. the odds, brother, were. Uh, the odds were actually stacked up against you pretty hard for your quit alone yeah. because of all the, all the craziness that you had to have been going through. And even the post-operative, the fact that you didn't just spring out of uh, the surgery like a lot of friends that I've had, you know, they'll spend multiple weeks in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Then they'll come out and the very first thing they do is go to a goddamn 7-Eleven. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yep. So you had yeah. all these things, and you came out stronger in your quit. You came out successful in your surgery. 
And to this day, two years re- later, you're still quit, and you're on on this podcast talking about the successes of your surgery and your quit and uh, your your perseverance over your your other medical uh, um, challenges. I, I, it's just a success story across the board, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I just love to watch people take this deal or what in in whatever corner they are in their life, no matter what what it is. I love to watch people take steps and and have success in changing the trajectory of their lives and and being uh, you know frankly i'll just say a better version of themselves yeah uh than than where they started it's uh, inspiring to me and it sp- inspires others to take the same action and uh and i keep beating that drum and that's what like i said that's what my that's that is the purpose behind my podcast to help people recover and heal and uh, become better aligned with their true purpose. Yeah, and yeah. I really love that being the topic of the uh, of Chris's super big book. Right in the very first chapter is talking about you know he talks about remembering who you the original you is, and and taking the steps necessary to align the current you with that original you yep there's a lucky few out there that seem to be able to hang on to that but most of us get our spirit stepped on along the way in various oh, ways yeah. and and we become something other than what we were and uh and, and our and and you can feel that's that same kind of that's that that's that gut down there telling you when you're getting the extra plate or i'm making the second run to the liquor store or i'm <laughs> you know i'm making sure that i've got you know i'm going to be away for the weekend so i need like two rolls of dip to make damn sure <laughs> i don't run out this weekend uh you know it, it, but inside me i know that that there's something not in alignment. I can feel that my compass oh, yeah. needle is not in alignment with who I really need to be, and oh. and that's that little tap on the shoulder that's saying, uh, "Hey, man, uh, this is not really you. This is not really yeah. you." Yeah, and, and you know, and, and to go along with that, you know, I've gotten you know comfortable with my quit with everything. You know, I just decided here. Well, it's just it's something I've been thinking about. I've been talking with uh, Brad. You, you mentioned earlier, coaches. Uh, for about a year about this now. Uh, I've recently, on my two-year, I, I decided I'm not going to post on that site anymore. Ah. And that was a big decision for me to make. But at some point, you know, it kind of goes along with what we were talking about. I replaced one habit with another. Not that that isn't important. I, you know, I think the posting is the exact reason why I stayed quit. But my whole thing is I don't get anything from that site anymore. You know, my support is through the text that I send daily through the, the, the two different group meetings I'm a part of. And what going on with that habit? Yesterday, I felt weird. You know, all day, uh-huh. it was nagging at me. You know, I didn't post today. Yeah. You know, even though I text 15 guys every day, and you guys see my, my morning thing. And, yep. You know, but, you know, at some point, you have to let go. <laughs> uh, yep. uh-huh. A little bit. You know, I, I call it taking the training wheels off, I guess. But. Yep, and yeah. you know, frankly, if something is not really working for you anymore, that's when you need to change it. And, uh, and that's sometimes it takes sometimes a change is in order, and to be able to be yeah. aware of that and, and take the action to change something that's not, you know, um, in my in my life, I need things that are two way street. Uh, I, I need to be given, and I need to also be getting something back. And, yep. and, and if, if that's and not a balance, then uh, generally, whatever that is, I will nowadays uh, mm-hmm. uh, usually start turning loose of that if it's not if it's not feeling like a, a two way street. Yeah, yeah uh, and, and more about, negative is coming back at you than positive. Yeah, uh, that's that. That's why I don't miss the place. I did miss it though. For I I I'd, I'd be a liar. I had to withdrawals. You know, yeah, I had yeah. some withdrawals, but then I had to keep reminding myself. Why am I not there anymore? Because they don't want me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, my, my, my reason for leaving is it has nothing to do with that. I mean, I, I never really had oh, I know. the kind of issues that you yep. guys had. No. So, you just uh, said you weren't, you know, you weren't feeling Yeah, you know, I wasn't. Fed. I mean, I put, I put up, you know, a nice post in there, I think, because I, you know, my quit is because of that site, you know, despite what goes on there and everything else. Yep. So, Same here. Uh, I thank them all. You know, I put it. I know that I can go back there if I need to. I mean, I know you guys are all different. Yeah. But. All right, so we're back. Yeah, I'm. I'm right on the verge of our cable service. You're living in the country, so sometimes it can be kind of. <laughs> 
Well, as I was saying to Jim a minute ago, uh, I, I always have a wonder about exactly when uh, that might happen. And I've been lucky so far through the remote podcast I've done. I've not had an outage. My bigger fear is that I will have it. Uh, yeah. And I never even really, I honestly didn't even consider a guest having uh, a clip out. <laughs> but we've been a little over two hours here now. And uh, and I'm probably going to like, pro- I don't edit these podcasts very often, but I probably will like yeah. clip out that this little window here. Uh, yeah. But so, uh, uh, is there anything else you want to get talk about before we uh, close this thing up? What I, I have a I, one of my other favorite uh, podcasters, and if you haven't listened to it, it's a meat eater podcast, and he'll like me mentioning that, even though he don't know me. Uh, it's Steve mm-hmm. Ranella, and he does it's a hunting podcast, and oh. uh, and I really like it. It's called Meat Eater, um, and he says he goes around the table and asks, does anybody have any concluders? So I always give everybody an opportunity to say a closing thought. And uh, if you have a concluder, I'm ready. Okay. Well, mine would be, uh, as far as the, the weight loss surgery and all that stuff goes, that if somebody is ready to do that for themselves and are going to put in the work and and have the motivation to do what they need to do, that it is it will 100% change your life for the better. Um, you know, don't go down all the rabbit holes that we discussed in here. You know, that's just, is more information, you know, to look out for, but it will change you for the better. Yeah, man. That's, that's pretty much my final thoughts on it. Jim? Well, I, I, I think uh, a, a lot of the points that we made today were uh, relevant across the board. The weight loss, uh, we, we, we talked some alcoholism, we talked the nicotine addiction. <coughs> and uh, Dave, I'll just, uh, I, I'll just finish by saying I'm glad to have you a member of the Fury Council. Um, uh, your, your knowledge on, on many fronts is always a... Uh, it's always appreciated. So, thanks for oh, doing this with us. For, I thank you for allowing me on there. <laughs> ah, no problem, and and thanks for doing this podcast with us. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I've, I've really thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, we've got two. Um, by all accounts, we've got two new nicotine quitters coming in a few days. So well, that's always good. I always like it when I have some. Um, you know, there's some. It spurs my quit when I got somebody to help. Yeah. With theirs, so that's getting ready yeah. to happen. Well, Dave, thanks for sharing your story with us today. Oh, uh, you're welcome. It certainly is inspiring. Uh, I'm, uh, I'd like to talk to you for just a second, and I don't know if... Uh, what I would like to do is I put a photograph up on the podcast of the guests when I can do that. Is there any chance I could get like a picture of a before and an after that I could glue together, that I could patch yeah. together and yeah, use as the, as the picture on the... Because uh, I've seen the pictures myself, and uh, right. and it does the uh, a picture's worth a million words when it comes to this, uh, right. definitely. So thank you for uh, sharing your story on here. Um, I'm I'm honored that you uh, allow allowed me to record it and get it here on the podcast. Uh, with that, we'll close this thing up. And as always, go to spiritualunderground.org for the show notes. Uh, pictures of the guests, a contact me page. If there's anybody I can get you in contact with or myself, I'll be more than happy to try and help. Uh, music around this is by our co- my co-host today, Jim. And the book, 12 Step Spiritual Recovery, which Jim mentioned for a minute there, uh, was uh, is available on Amazon. By, it's uh, 12 Step Spiritual Recovery by James Christopher Cohn. And woo, there went something. Somebody's phone buzzing. Yeah, it's my phone. Sorry. And uh, and DTMWW.net for any woodworking or handyman needs in the Louisville metropolitan area. As always, if you're not having a blast in your quit, if you're not having a blast in your recovery, if you're not having a blast in your weight loss expedition, it is your own damn fault. Thank you all for allowing me to participate in my recovery in this manner today. Peace out.